آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في العرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الرحم وأكرمني جنوب الفهم اللهم أفتح علينا أدواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن أولئك رحمتك يا رحمة الله Today we have uh, another hadith about knowledge and this is in the Harul Anwar volume 233. The Harul Anwar volume 233. Allah Majlisi quotes from Tafsir of Imam Hassan al Askari. In that Tafsir, Imam Hassan al Askari quotes a story about Lady Fatima Hadarat imra'atun inda siddiqa Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam A lady went to Lady Fatima salamu alayhi Faqalat inna li walidatan wa'ifa waqad lubisa alayha fi amr salatiha shayun She said I have a mother who is very weak, very, you know, old or very ill, and she has some problems with her prayer, for salah, some uh, questions, and is in God's guidance. But, وَقَدْ بَعَثَتْنِي إِلَيْكِ She has asked me to come and ask you, because she was not able to come, she has sent me to you. فَأَجَابَتْهَا فَاطِمَةُ عَلَيْهَا السَّلَامُ and ذلك. Lady Fatima gave answer to the questions that she had about how to say salat. فَثَنَّتْ She asked the second question then. Lady Fatima answered. ثُمَّ ثَلَّثَتْ Then she asked for the third time. إِلَىٰ أَنْ عَشَّرَتْ Ten times she kept asking questions. ثُمَّ خَجِلَتْ مِنَ الْكَفْرَةِ She felt embarrassed that I'm asking too many questions, you know. She had asked ten times and she felt very embarrassed. فَقَالَتْ لَا أَشُقُّ عَلَيْكِ يَبْنَةَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Am I not troubling you, daughter of the Prophet? قَالَتْ فَاطِمَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ حَاتِي وَسَلِي عَمَّا بَدَالَكِ بَدَالَكِ then he said, ask whatever you want. Then, to explain why she should not feel embarrassed to ask questions, lady said, أَرَأَيْتِ مَنْ اكْتُرِيَ يَوْمًا يَسْعَدُ إِلَىٰ سَطْحٍ بِحَمْلٍ ثَقِيلٍ Lady said, if someone is hired to take some heavy good to a high put, uh, place. For example, on top of a hill or, you know, top floor. So he's hired to take this weight to a high place. وَكِرَاهُ مِئَةُ أَلْفْ دِينَارِ But the payment is 100,000 dinar. Dinar is golden coin. So to take this good, which is heavy, to that high place, is given 100,000 dinar. يَثْقُلُ عَلَيْهِ Then would it be difficult for him? فَقَالَتْ لَا She said, no, of course. If such a payment is given to someone, everyone wants to do this. <laughs> then Lady Fatima said, اُكْتُرِيتُ عَنَا لِكُلِّ مَسْأَلَةٍ بِأَكْثَرَ مِنْ مِلْءِ مَا بَيْنَ الثَّرَى إِلَى الْعَرْشِ لُؤْلُعَ Lady said, every question that you ask me, the payment that I receive is more than feeling from the sky to the earth with لُؤْلُعَ The curve. فَأَحْرَى أَلَّا يَثْقُلَ عَلَيَّ So, if that person, when he receives 100,000 dinar, doesn't feel, you know, tired or it's difficult, I am supposed to be better. 
I shouldn't feel any pain, any burden. Sami'atu Abi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam yaqul. Then Lady Fatima said, I heard my father saying, Inna ulama ashi'atina yuhsharoon. The knowledgeable people of our Shia, our followers, will be resurrected. فَيُخْلَعُ عَلَيْهَمْ مِنْ خِلْعِ الْكَرَامَاتِ Then they will be given the dresses of honor. عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ كَثْرَةِ عُلُومِهِمْ وَجِدْهِمْ فِي إِرْشَادِ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ Then according to the level of their knowledge and according to the level of efforts that they made for guiding people, these two factors are very important. The knowledge that they had and the efforts that they made. Because sometimes people have no knowledge or have knowledge but they don't make efforts. Depending on how much knowledge they had and how much efforts they made, they will be given these dresses of honor. Sometimes one of them is given million of dresses of light. These are the people who have great knowledge and have guided many people. Look at, for example, Allama Tabatabali. I don't think there is any scholar in the Shia world, and maybe even Sunni world, many, but at least in Shia world, I don't think there is any scholar today who has not benefited from his knowledge, in a way or another. Either directly or indirectly. Ayatollah Mutahari, you know? These are the people who have knowledge and who have made efforts. Hatta yukhla ala al-wahid minhum alf alf hullah. Thousand and thousand and million. One million dress of honor. Thumma yunadi munadi rabbina azza wa jal. Then a person on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call. Will make a call. On the day of judgment. Ayyuha al-kafiluna l'aytaam ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All those who have looked after the orphans of Ahlul Bayt. Because, you know that in the absence of Prophet and Amir al-Mu'mineen, we are all orphans. Ana wa aliyyun adaba hadhi al-Ummah. Ali and I are fathers or parents of this Ummah. So now in the time of absence of Imam, we are orphaned. <coughs> so these ulama will be said, all oh, the people who have looked who looked after the orphans of Ali Muhammad. <laughs> those who cared and looked after them when they were separate from their fathers who are Imams. Imams are our father. These are your students. And these are the orphans that you looked after them. Now you give them the dresses of honor which is from knowledge in dunya. فَيَخْلَعُونَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ وَاحِدٍ مِنْ أُولَٰئِكَ الْأَيْتَامِ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ مَا أَخَذُوا عَنْهُمْ مِنَ الْعُلُومِ Then these ulama who have themselves been given these dresses of honor, they give to the people who have learned from them according to how much they have learned from them in dunya. Okay? عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ مَا أَخَذُوا عَنْهُمْ According to the amount of knowledge that they have taken from them in dunya, now this alam gives them this dress of honor of light in akhirah. To the extent that some of them get up to 100,000. So the ulama get up to one million maximum. These learners get up to 
100,000. Okay? وكذلك يخلعوا هؤلاء الأيتام على من تعلم منهم. Then these people in turn give to the people that have learned from them. Maybe you learn something, then you go and teach someone else. Okay? So, you give to the people who have learned from you. ثم إن الله تعالى يقول أعيدوا علي هؤلاء العلماء الكافلين للأيتام حتى تتم لهم خلعهم Then Allah says, bring back these ulama who looked after these orphans and multiply for them the gift. فَيُتِمُّ لَهُمْ مَا كَانَ لَهُمْ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَخْلَعُوا عَلَيْهِمْ وَيُضَاعَفُ لَهُمْ Then whatever they were given before giving to those people will be completed and will be multiplied. وَكَذَلِكَ مَنْ يَلِيهِمْ مِمَّنْ خَلَعَ عَلَى مَنْ يَلِيهِمْ Then the people who taken from them and passed on, they will be brought and will be given and multiplied. The same. قَالَتْ فَاطِمَةُ عَلَيْهَا السَّلَامُ يَا أَمَتَ اللَّهِ Then Lady Fatima said to that woman, O servant of God, إِنَّ السِّلْكَةً مِنْ تِلْكَ الْخِلَعْ لَأَفْضَلُ مِنْ مَا طَلَعَتْ عَلَيْهِ الشَّانْسِ أَلْفَ أَلْفْ مَرَّةِ وَمَا فَضَلْ فَإِنَّهُ مَشُوبٌ بِالتَّنْقِيسَ وَالْكَلَةِ Then the Lady Fatima said, even a little piece of those dress, those khil'ah, is better than whatever sun is shining on it in dunya. One million times better, even more. Because in dunya, there is always mixture of pain and problem. Anything in dunya <coughs> is not free from trouble or pain. But what Allah gives in akhirah is free from any problem. So, there is no way to measure the value of knowledge and teaching and learning. If the smallest part of that dress comes to dunya, the value is more than everything that sun is shining on. So now, lady explained to her why she should not be feel embarrassed when she is asking questions. Because Allah is giving the lady so much that she is more than happy to pass on the knowledge and teach. May Allah inshallah include us among the people who have knowledge and practice and pass on. <coughs> okay, now inshallah we want to uh, continue our discussion with uh, Unit 3. Alhamdulillah, we finished Unit 2. Unit 3 is about human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created uh, uh, Sorry, uh, I, I should finish uh, something uh, I, I forgot uh, about suffering and then I move on to the Unit 3. Uh, because I want to expand more about suffering. Uh, about uh, this world, before we go to the human beings, we said that this world is the best possible world, the best possible physical world. It's not perfect. And we said that there are problems that we cannot avoid because of the interactions between different physical objects and because of the limitations that we have. But there are problems that we can avoid. There are problems that are caused by human beings, not maybe by me, maybe by someone else, maybe by tyrants. Maybe some people did something bad a few generations ago, and it has impact on us. Maybe today we are doing, for example, something we are not careful about environment. It has impact on other generations. But anyway, these are the things that could be avoided. So these are the problems that we have added to the limitations of the world. But, again, 
the planning of Allah is the best possible plan for this world. Because even when human beings misuse their freedom, still the planning has no problem. It's better to have human beings with freedom and pay the cost, which is that sometimes they may do bad things, than having no freedom. If we were forced to be always good or we were created in the way that we always automatically do good things, we were not able to reach the position that we are able to reach now. The position of being Khalifatullah, the wise citizen of Allah on the earth, is not given even to the angels. Because for them there is no possibility of being tested and tried like us. Therefore for them to be good is natural. It's not an achievement. It's not a success. It's not a foes. For us it's an achievement. But the cost is that some people may go to the wrong direction. Okay. <coughs> now, what is important is that when people suffer in this world, and this suffering is not caused by themselves. It is caused because of the natural order or by other people. You know, sometimes I am not careful, I don't look after my health. Sometimes there is something genetic or, you know, some germ has come from outside. I have no role. These are different. If it is caused by me, then I am responsible. But any suffering which is not caused by me, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards us so much that we will be fully satisfied. So, although this was natural in this world, but still He comes and gives us so much reward that we will be satisfied. And indeed, Allah gives so much that on the Day of Judgment, everyone wishes that He had suffered more. First, I read for you some hadith, then I have an explanation. Imam Sadiq salam was asked about bala, calamities, difficulties. Dhukira inda Abi Abdullah alayhi salam al-bala wa ma yakhussu Allah azza wa jal bihi al-mu'min. And those balas that comes for believers, some of the balas come for mu'mineen. فَقَالَ السُّئِلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Imam Sadiq said, Rasulullah was asked the question, مَنْ أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ بَلَا أَنْفِ الدُّنْيَا Who are the people who have greatest suffering in dunya, greatest calamities, tragedies? فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ said, أَنَّبِيُّونَ The Prophets. The Prophets suffered more than anyone else. They went through difficulties more than anyone else. ثُمَّ الْأَمْثَلْ فَالْأَمْثَلْ Then those who were closer to the Prophets, they suffered more than others. They were the second in suffering. Then those who were closer to those who were closer, they suffered more. وَيُبْتَلَىٰ الْمُؤْمِنُوا بَعْدُوا عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ إِيمَانِهِ وَحُسْنَ أَعْمَالِهِ Then after that we reach the level of mu'mineen, after prophets and imams. Mu'mineen, according to the level of their iman and their good actions, they will suffer. فَمَنْ سَحَ إِيمَانُهُ وَحَسُنَ عَمَلُهُ اشْتَدَّ بَلَاؤُهُ Whoever is higher in Iman and has better A'mal, he will suffer more. Unfortunately, sometimes people think those who suffer, they are bad people. And if they see someone suffering, they say, oh, he must have committed some sins, you know, he was careless. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is true that sometimes people suffer because of sins. Because they are careless. 
is not all the time like this. You cannot generalize. Indeed, those who are very good, they can suffer more. But we will explain why. وَمَنْ سَخُفَ إِيمَانُهُ وَضَعُفَ عَمَلُهُ قَلَّبَ لَعُفَ Those whose iman is weak and their righteous deeds are little, their calamities are less. They suffer less. Sometimes they see a mu'man has illness or, you know, in family has illness or you know, poverty or so many problems. But a person who is kafir seems that he has no problem. You shouldn't be surprised. <coughs> the people who suffered more than anyone else were the prophets. And among the prophets, which prophet suffered more than anyone else? Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad. Ma nabiyun misla ma No prophet was annoyed like me. So the closest person to Allah are the prophets and they suffered more than anyone else. Among the prophets, the closest was Prophet Muhammad and he suffered more than any other prophet. When he was not yet born, his father died. Imagine a child who has never seen his father. Then when he was very young, his mother passed away. Then his grandfather was looking after him, his grandfather passed away. He had a good wife, she passed away. Good uncle, Abu Talib, passed away. All the difficulties and tragedies, all those battles, all those, you know, 13 years in Mecca, full of problems, 10 years in Medina, full of problems. Troubles coming from people who were around and close. So Rasulullah suffered more than anyone else. Even Rasulullah suffered because he knew the tragedies which are going to happen to Ahlul Bayt afterwards. <coughs> you shouldn't think that Rasulullah didn't know. Rasulullah used to cry for Imam Hussein because he knew what is going to happen to him. He knew what is going to happen to Lady Fatima. So he has suffered also for the tragedies that happened after him. So, Ma Uziya Nabiyun, Mr. Ma How much Amir al Mumini suffered? From childhood, he suffered. When he was young, he was not able to stay with his parents because parents, you know, had financial problems. So some of the children were looked after by family members. So although at that time, maybe it was a kind of tragedy that you have to leave your parents, but the plan of Allah was that he was brought up by Rasulullah. So when he was a small child, Rasulullah accepted to look after Ali. And Amirul Mu'min when he was at home, he was so nice that he says that Aqil had problem in his eyes. You know, Aqil later also became blind. So he had problem in his eyes. <coughs> and when parents wanted to put some oil, something, some medicine in his eyes, he was not accepting. So they used to put first in the eye of Ali and then say, look, Ali is letting us to put in his eye, then Aqil was accepting. So Ali who was not ill and was not in need, he was so obedient and patient that they were first putting in his eye and then putting in the eye of Aqil. How much Amir al it suffered, you know, he was 10 years that embraced Islam and all those difficulties in Mecca, he went through. Then he slept in the house of the Prophet when the Prophet was migrating. Then in Medina, battles. Then after the Prophet, losing Lady Fatima, 25 years, that Imam says, Then five years of Jamal, Nahrawans, you know, Safin. So he suffered more than any successor. So, suffering in this dunya is not a sign of being a bad person. Indeed, those who are good, 
they should expect more problems come to them. But the thing is that the problems are not in their Iman. The worst type of suffering is when you suffer in your Iman, in your religion. You know this beautiful dua, Allahumma la taj'al musibatana fi deenana. Oh Allah, please don't make our sufferings in our Iman. There are people who have no suffering in body or money, but they don't have Iman. This is the greatest tragedy. We ask Allah that inshallah our suffering, our tragedy, our calamity is not in our Iman. It is in something outside, something worldly. Imam Baqir alayhi salam said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى إِذَا أَحَبَّ عَبْدًا غَثَّهُ بِالْبَلَاءِ غَثَّهُ Imam Baqir said, sometimes when Allah loves a servant very much, He covers him with bala. Look at Imam Hussain alayhi salam. How much Imam Hussain alayhi salam suffered? If you know, you really think about all the sufferings of Imam, you wonder, you know, how he didn't, you know, have a heart attack. How he didn't, you know, manage to survive. For one person to see all those tragedies, especially if you know that they are very kind people. You shouldn't think that they have no emotions. You know, they are more kind and, you know, more passionate than normal people. But still, how much patience he had for suffering of Lady Zayna. So, Imam Bagr says, when Allah loves someone, غَثَّهُ بِالْبَلَاءِ غَثَّهُ He will cover him with calamities and problems. Then Imam says, when someone asks Allah to give him something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Labbaik. Allah says, yes, I am able to give you what you want. But, Wala in dakharutu laka, fama dakharutu laka, fahuwa khayrun lak. But if I save this for you, it's better for you. You ask me to give you something in dunya, but it's better if I don't give you and save this for your akhirah. There is a hadith which says, when mu'mineen on the day of judgment see what Allah gives them for the du'as which were not answered in dunya, they say, I wish none of my du'as were answered. Because that is the time that we are in greatest need. And also the amount that we can be given is much more than that we are given dunya. <coughs> so you ask for something in dunya, you will be great, given something greater, but greater also in akhirah. So it's greater, but it is also coming when you have more need. Another hadith is from Abdullah ibn Abi Ya'fur, a companion of Imam Sadiq He says, Shakawtu ila Abi Abdullah alayhi salam alqa min al awja'ah. He said, I complained to Imam Sadiq that I have many problems, many pains. Wa kana misqaman. Misqam comes from suqm, illness. Saqim is ill. He was a person who had long, uh, you know, for long time illnesses. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said, فَقَالَ لِي يَا عَبْدَ اللَّهِ لَوْ يَعْلَمُ الْمُؤْمِنْ مَا لَهُ مِنَ الْمَصَائِبِ If mu'min knows how much Allah gives him for suffering, like illness, poverty, loss of children, I don't know, money, whatever. If mu'min knows how much Allah gives him, if he knows how much Allah gives him for his suffering, 
he would ask that my body was made into pieces by Caesar all my life. It's not that you will regret. You wish you had more. There is a hadith in Musakkin al Fuad in the Faqd al Ahibbat wal Awlad. This book is Alhamdulillah translated to English and available on Al Islam org. Musakkin al Fuad in the Faqd al Ahibbat wal Awlad. I think uh, it is translated as Comforter of the Heart by Shahid Asani. It's on, online. Uh, in that book, because Shahid Asani himself lost his child, and then for himself and for other people who would have suffering, he wrote this book and brought many beautiful hadiths. Alhamdulillah, is in English also, you can read. So, he mentions very uh, beautiful hadiths about the people who suffer. For example, if someone loses his child when he is alive, it means that you see the death of your child. How much Allah gives you? The hadith says, he will be given more than the one who has offered 70 mujahid who die after him. Let me read for you from the book. Imam Baghir alayhi salam says, there are several hadiths. One is from Imam Baghir. Man qaddama awladan yahtasibuhum indallahi ta'ala. If someone, before he or she dies, his or her children die. Qaddama means before him. Yahtasibuhum indallahi ta'ala. And he says to Allah that this was your amana coming back to you, you give me the reward. Then these children who died before you die will be barrier between you and Jahannam. <coughs> they don't let you to go to Jahannam. Imam Sadiq salam said, Waladun Wahid. يقدمه الرجل أفضل من سبعين يخلفهم من بعده. One child who dies before you die is better than seventy child who the children who die after you. كلهم قد ركبوا الخيل وقاتلوا في سبيل الله. Is better than seventy children who die after you. And they are mujahid. So if one child has cancer and dies, it's better than leaving seven, 70 mujahid after you. Can you imagine? Because those who die after you, you don't have musibah. You don't have suffering for them. But when they die, you have suffering for them. You know, Hazrat Abu al-Fazl Abbas, on the day of Ashura, he first asked his brothers to go. Some people say he asked because he wanted to make sure that they don't change their mind. But I don't think that was the reason. I think he wanted to see the suffering. He wanted to suffer for them instead of them suffering for him. You know? Because when you see the suffering, is different. It's similar to enfaq, to sadaqah, charity. 
if I give one dollar when I am alive is better than living one million dollars say after I die give it to people so why you didn't give yourself when you die and you are not using you say give it to people you might have heard this story that a person when he died they distributed big store of dates according to his will then one date was dropped on the ground on the floor and it is said that Rasulullah said if he had given this when he was alive was better than giving this after he died of course giving even after you die is good you know make the will but if you can give it before it's better because when you give you feel the pain yeah but when it is after you, anyway, you have lost it, <coughs> you don't feel any pain. So, waladun wahid yuqaddimuhu rajul afwal min sab'een yakhlufuhum min ba'de kulhum ad rakibul khayl wa qatalu fi sabidillah. In another hadith says, ولد واحد يقدمه الرجل أفضل من سبعين ولدا يبغون بعده يدركون القائم أجل الله تعالى فرجه. One child that dies when you are alive is better than seventy children who would be with Imam Zaman, would be helpers of Imam Zaman. This is the great reward that Allah gives for the people who suffer on the other hand if someone doesn't suffer this is alarming قال أبو عبد الله عليه السلام دعي النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم إلى طعام once Rasulullah was invited for a meal فلما دخل منزل الرجل when Rasulullah entered the house of this person, Nazara ila dajajan, dajajatan, for the haid. Rasulullah saw a hen on a wall. Qad baawat, laying egg. When hen wants to lay egg, goes to a place nobody doesn't go on the wall. But this hen went on top of the wall and laid eggs on top of the uh, wall. فَتَّقَعُ الْبِيضَ عَلَى وَتَدٍ فِي حَالِ Then egg dropped. But there was a nail on the wall. The egg dropped and uh, uh, stayed on the nail. How difficult is it even if you want to put egg on the nail is difficult. This happened by accident. Egg came and stopped here. Didn't break. فَتَّقَعُ الْبِيْذَ عَلَى وَتَدٍ فِي حَائِطِ فَثَبَتَتْ عَلَيْ وَلَمْ تَسْقُطْ وَلَمْ تَنْكَسَرْ It didn't drop, it didn't break. فَتَعَجَّبَ النَّبِي صَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمَ رسول الله was surprised. فَقَالَ لَهُ الرَّجُلُ The man who had invited Rasulullah said, أَعَجِبْتَ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْبَيْضَةِ أو رسول الله are you surprised that this egg didn't break فَبَلَّذِي بَعَثَكَ بِالْحَقِّ Please listen very carefully. He said by Allah who has raised you as a prophet truthfully مَا رُزِعْتُ شَيْئًا قَدْتُ By Allah I have never had any suffering in my life. Never anything bad has happened to me. Anything broken or burnt, any loss, nothing. فَنَّهَضَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَلَمْ يَأْكُلْ مِنْ تَعَامِهِ شَيْئًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ stood up and didn't eat anything there. وَقَالَ مَنْ لَمْ يُرْزَعْ فَمَا لِلَّهِ فِي مِنْ قَادِرٍ رسول الله said if someone has not had any suffering, any trouble, it means that Allah has left him to himself. Allah doesn't want him. He thought this is a sign of being a special person that Allah loves but Rasulullah even didn't want to stay there didn't want to eat anything so it means that Allah has left you to yourself 
So you see the difference between the perspective of people. Some people think that those who suffer are bad. But indeed, it's quite different. So, when a person suffers and remains patient, the reward that Allah gives is so much that cannot be compared to anything else. How much you gain for your salat, for fasting, for zakat? A lot. At least ten times more. Man ja'ab al-hasana falahu ashra'am salat. Yeah, everything good at least ten times. Sometimes it can be more. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفَقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلَ حَبَّةً أَنْبَتَتْ سَبْعَ سَنَابِلْ فِي كُلِّ سُنْبُلَ مِئَةُ حَبَّةً If you give one pound sadaqah, it's like one seed you plant, you put in the soil, it has seven years and each hundred seed, it becomes seven hundred. So one pound becomes seven hundred. وَاللَّهُ يُضَاعِفُ لِمَنْ لَشَا Allah also multiplies that. Can be 1400, can be 2100. <coughs> Sometimes one recitation of Quran in the months of Ramadan is one verse is like completing the whole Quran in other places, other times. Doing one action in the Laylatul Qadr is like doing the same action 1000 months continuously. So Allah rewards a lot. But when it comes to patience, <coughs> those who suffer, Allah says, إِنَّمَا يُغَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابِ The people who are patient, they are rewarded without measure. Not 1,000 times more or 100,000 times more. Without measure. So, who are the richest people? The people who have more a'mal or people who have had more patience. The people who have more patience. On the day of judgment, those who have had great suffering and remain patient, they are the richest people. Among them, those whose suffering was more, they are richer. Among Sabirun themselves, those who have more suffering. This is why we say in Ziyarat Ashura, As'aluhu an yu'tiyani bi musabi bikum afdhala ma yu'ti musaban bi musibati. The reward that we want for mourning for Imam Hussain is not, you know, this is very important point. The reward that you get for mourning for Imam Hussein is not the reward of action. <coughs> Many times people make mistakes, most of the time. They think that mourning for Imam Hussein is a good action and there is reward for that. No, this is not enough. You should mourn for Imam Hussein as a matter of suffering, not as a matter of action. Not that it is a good action. It's a matter of suffering. It means that it is through your pain that you will be rewarded. Not through what you do. If you Allah, lose your child, are you then going to do some actions? Or are you going to have pain and suffering? This pain and suffering should be there in the morning for Imam Hussain. And when you have pain and suffer, it means that you have lost someone. A calamity has happened. So this is your musibah. It's not musibah of Imam Hussein and then you say, you know, to Imam Hussein, you know, we are to, con you know, offer our condolences to you. This is my own suffering. You say if you uh, you get pain more when you mourn for Imam Hussein. Yeah. People who zanjir the cut themselves, and some uh, ulama have said that it's not allowed. Yeah. So they are doing pain. So can you explain that a bit more? Yeah. 
So they have to try to get more. You know, that is not the right type of pain. Indeed, some of those people can never cry. You know, they do these all things, but sometimes they have no little tears on their eyes. I'm not saying all of them, but some of them. Pain is something in the heart. Pain is sadness. And this sadness sometimes reaches the level that you shed tears. Sometimes maybe you, you don't reach that level. But the main thing is sadness of the heart. By looking at what someone is doing with his body, you cannot understand he's sad or not. Maybe someone is doing lots of activities, but he's not sad. You know, something that uh, I never forget, once uh, after some operation, uh, they showed him on TV. You know, towards the end of his life, he was very old and he had a, a <coughs> Uh, then, in his, uh, I think it was house or office, he was sitting on a chair and they were reciting Musiba uh, of And he was not moving at all. But tears were coming. I never forget this, because many of us, to be able to shed tears, you know, we have to do some of the things, you know, we have to move, you know, we have to put pressure. But to sit like this, doing nothing, and then tear coming, is very difficult. You have control over your body, you do, but tears coming. I don't know if you have experienced this. It's very difficult for us not to move and then have tears come. So what is important is that it must come from heart. And for heart to feel the pain, you need ma'rifah. So, uh, I think about two years ago in Muharram, we had a series, uh, a spiritual struggle of Karbala. So, in few sessions, I explained what is Azadari, what is mourning. And we said that mourning is to express your sorrow for the loss of a beloved one in public. And then, to have this sorrow, you have to have ma'rifah, what I have lost. If you have ma'rifah about what you have lost, then automatically pain comes. And if it reaches the level of shedding tear, then this shows that you have matured in your pain. Okay? But physical actions are, uh, you know, on the surface. And we have to check. If they are according to Islamic rules, according to culture, no misunderstanding is caused, no co uh, confusion, they are okay. But the main thing is ma'rifa, it is hosn, it is to share Imam Hussein in his suffering. So, as'aluhu an yu'tiyani bi musabi likum afwala ma yu'ti musaban bi musibah. I ask Allah to give me, because of my musibah, I have suffered, I have lost you. So I ask him to give me the best he has ever given to any person who has suffered. Why? Because I have lost more than anyone else. Musibatan ma a'zama wa a'zama raziyataha sama So, my musibah is greatest musibah. Therefore, I hope that Allah gives me the greatest reward. So, here, by joining Imam Hussain a.s. and sharing with Imam Hussain in his suffering, you can gain the reward which is indeed for Imam Hussain, not for us. <coughs> but this is the beauty of being connected to Imam Hussain. So, Allah gives you what he gives to Imam Hussain and the Ahlul Bayt. And this is why we say then, وَأَسْأَلُهُ أَنْ يُبَلَّغَنَ الْمَقَامَ الْمَحْمُودَ لَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهِ I ask Allah to enable me to reach the praise position that you have. It's your position. But we come to you. Because on the Day of Judgment, people go and join their Imams. يَوْمَ نَدْعُ كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِ Yes, sir.
know, in Christianity there's a concept of redemptive suffering. Yeah. Is there any parallel in the Shia belief of this? And is this what you're alluding to? Is there a different understanding? Yeah, it's, it's similar, but there is a big difference. In Christianity, at least, uh, the popular view is that Isa alayhi salam has suffered and because of his suffering, whoever believes in Isa, even if they don't have right actions, they are saved. We say Imam Hussein has suffered and if you join him and you also suffer, then you will be saved. So you have to join him and by joining him means you have to be his follower. You have to do his actions. You have to say salah, you have to fast, you have to pay zakat. But none of your actions are enough by themselves. It is through the patience and sabr that you can get to Imam Hussein. So there is a similar point and that is about the power of suffering. But the difference is that we don't say only for, by Imam Hussein suffering we are forgiven. We say we are forgiven if we show and prove that we are his follower. So that we also suffer for the same causes as Imam Hussein suffered. And we listen to Imam Hussein, we follow Imam Hussein. So if there is a movement, who does his a'mal wajibat, refrains from haram? And still, we have lots of problems. Because our a'mal are not significant. And we have so many problems. If you do our best, and then join Imam Hussain alayhi salam in his suffering and musibah, then inshallah you will be saved. This is the power of musibah, the power of love for the one who had greatest suffering. But if I do a'mal of Yazid, and then I say, you know, I want to be with Imam Hussain. I don't say my salat like Yazid. I look at now Mahram with Yazid. I drink like Yazid. So then I say, I am with Imam Hussain. You know, it's ridiculous. No one, you know, would listen to me. But if I do my best to follow him, if I have Husseini character, but still I am a weak person, I have had problems, then we can benefit. So, part of it is similar, but part of it is different. What's interesting is that, you know, even in Christianity you have people who take it as a physical suffering. So you had, in the 15th and 16th century, people who were flagellants, and that's yeah. different from people doing azadari in the sense that we see it today. Yeah. So yes. How they actually interpret that. So, the main thing is that, you have to yourself also suffer by following that person and being ready to pay the cost for following the path. There is a hadith which says on the day of judgment some martyrs will see that some people are going to heaven ahead of them. These martyrs are surprised. They ask, who are these people? We have given our lives, but these people are going ahead. They will be said, these are Sadarun, the people who are patient. If you have given your life once, they were willing to die every day. You know, sometimes someone was Musiba, he or she prefers to die, but just to remain you know, patient, they have to accept, they cannot kill themselves. But they are ready to die. Something which is very important is that for us to be able to detach ourselves from dunya is very difficult. This dunya with all the problems and all the limitations, unfortunately, is very attractive. Yeah. Although we know that this dunya is for a short time, okay, and is not loyal to anyone, but still we fall in love with dunya. Imagine an old lady who has hundreds of thousands of years 
But with cosmetics, looks very beautiful. And you know, he has killed many lovers. <laughs> <laughs> then we fall in love with this old lady, who is hundreds of thousands of years old, has killed many people, has many problems. We fall in love. And you know that he has killed everyone so far. And at the same time, he is, she has affairs with many people. <laughs> so we fall in love. So, this is the problem. This is the root and foundation of every problem. Those who suffer, they become alert. They say, oh, I don't want this dunya. This dunya has caused me problems. So, they are ready for departure. Those who don't suffer, say we are enjoying ourselves. It seems that she's good. Why I should, you know, leave her? But those who see bad akhlaq of dunya and bad treatment of dunya, okay, they say, I don't want this. Then there is a chance they may go to a better world. So, if you want to summarize the whole point in a spirituality. What is it? The whole thing in a spirituality is to detach yourself from dunya, to get rid of your ego, and be willing to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the main thing. Why Allah says, if you are thinking that you are friends of Allah, you should be ready for this. And za'amtum annakum awliya'u lillah min dun al-nas Everyone who thinks that he has achieved something, you should test him how much he is ready to join Allah, go back to Allah. Okay? So those who suffer, they have this quality. They want to die sooner. They want to go to Allah sooner. Nothing in dunya is attractive. You know, if someone loses, for example, her child, no matter how much money or what type of house or you know, job she has, she has no interest anymore in dunya. Okay? So it means that she has been uplifted. Something that maybe after many years through a'mal she could not achieve, now she has achieved through this <coughs> suffering. There is a hadith which says, Sometimes, this is very important, sometimes there is a manzala, a rank, in Allah's knowledge for someone. That this person could achieve that rank. But he or she has not reached that rank through his or her a'mal. So it is only through musibah that he or she would achieve that rank. If you want to write the hadith, the hadith is like this. Sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam yahul. I heard Rasulullah saying, Inna al-abd, Iza thabagat lahu inna Allah ta'ala manzilakun. By the time I, uh, sorry, I forgot the time. Uh, we finish this hadith and we have a break. إن العبد إذا صدقت له عند الله تعالى منزلة When in the knowledge of Allah it is known in advance that this person can have this manzala, this stage, this rank ولم يبلغها بعمل But he has not reached that manzala through أعمال ابتلاه الله في جسده أو في ماله أو في ولده Allah will try him, test him. Means he, Allah puts him into difficulties in his body or money or children. Then he remains patient. Till he reach, or she reaches that rank that Allah knew for him. So this is the power of musibah, the power of suffering. 
let us have a short break and then inshallah we can continue. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alam. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى سيدنا الطاهر اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الله وأكرمنا من الفرح اللهم افتح علينا أطواب رحمتك وانصر علينا فزارنا ومنك رحمتك يا عبد الله So those who have patience, those who have sabr, it means that they have been able to achieve the highest quality. As you know, there is hadith which says, As-sabru min al-eeman bi manzillat al-ra'sa min al-jasad. Patience for iman is like head for body. Head is the highest and the most important part of body. If someone has Iman and all the A'mal but not patience, sooner or later his Iman will go away. He will lose Iman. But if has Sabr, then can keep and maintain Iman and grow Iman. If someone is a believer and suffers and is patient, of course it's the greatest possibility. If someone is not a mu'min and suffers and is patient, still he can be given something. Allah would not forget that this person has suffered. Because Allah is so kind and so merciful that if anyone does something good or has a good quality, Allah will take that into account. You know, there was a person called Hatam Ta'i. He had the quality of generosity. He was a mushrik. He died before Islam. But he is very much respected. According to some hadith, he will not be sent to hell. Although he is mushrik. He cannot go to heaven because heaven needs iman. But he will be put in between. Allah forgives his sins because he is generous. He has been helping people. If someone has a good quality or good action, either in dunya or at the time of death or in barzakh or at their judgment, somehow it would bear some good fruits for that person. But for the people who are iman, a mu'min, and have good amal, the best is if it is saved for their akhirah. So, if someone does something good and he doesn't believe in Akhirah, Allah will give him the reward more quickly. But if someone is mu'min, this is kept for the time that he is in greatest need and Allah can be more generous. You know, generosity of Allah can be best witness in heaven. Because dunya is not capable of showing the generosity of Allah. Dunya has lots of limitations. If Allah wants to be very generous to you, then what about other people around? Sometimes a mu'min suffers because if he doesn't suffer, then people become jealous. Other people suffer. Other people become enemies of Allah. There are so many factors that Allah has to observe in dunya. But in Sometimes in dunya Allah doesn't give me what I want because he knows I become, you know, then proud of myself. Yeah? For example, you ask Allah, I want to see Imam Zaman. Tens of years you ask Allah. But Allah knows that if you see Imam Zaman, then you become a different person. Maybe you don't have capacity. Either you become proud, say, oh, no one has seen Imam Zaman, I have seen Imam Zaman, so I must be a very special person. So you become proud. Or, if you see Imam Zaman once, and then you see, don't see him again, you cannot continue your life. You become like mad. So end of your life will be not normal. So he knows what is the best. But in heaven there is no problem. He can be most generous in heaven because no one is 
harming or affecting any other person in a negative way. Mm. Yes. This uh, Hakim Tai was very generous. Now he was before Islam, his message was sent. So surely God will forgive him and send him to heaven because he didn't have the message with him. What do you think? No, to go to heaven, Iman is needed. But to be forgiven is different. So you, some person uh, might be forgiven because he didn't have any access, he was excused. But the condition for heaven is آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَعَمِلَ الصَّالَةِ So without Iman in one God. Maybe, for example, he's not a Muslim. Maybe he's a believer in another religion. But must believe in one God and the hereafter and do righteous deeds to go to heaven. But if for some reason he was excused, he doesn't go to heaven, but he can be forgiven. And even those who were before Islam, still they had chance to know about at least that there is God. Because shirk is against fetra. There is a hadith from Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam. Again in the book, Heart Comforter or Musakkin al-Fu'ad. إِذَا جَمَعَ اللَّهُ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ When Allah brings all the people from early generations and last generations, you know, bring them together. أَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ يُنَادِ مُنَادٍ أَيْنَ الصَّابِرُونَ A call will be made. Who are the patient? Where are they? أَيْنَ Where are they? لِيَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ So that they go to heaven without need of accounting and you know judgment. قَالْ فَيَقُومُ أُنُقٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ Then a group of people will stand up. فَتَتَلَقَاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Then angels receive them. فَيَقُولُونَ إِلَىٰ أَيْنَ يَبْنَ آدَمٍ Then the angels tell them, where are you going? Children of Adam. فَيَقُولُونَ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ They say, we want to go to heaven. فَيَقُولُونَ وَقَبْلَ الْحِسَابِ The angels say, before judgment, still, you have to wait for judgment, or maybe they're testing them. فَقَالُوا نَعَمْ Then the angel says, They say yes. Then the angel says, "Waman anto? Who are you?" "Alu asabrun." They say we are patient people. So they introduce themselves as sabrun. So it is greatest achievement. "Alu wamaka na sabrukum." What was your patience? What did you, you know, have to suffer and be patient? قَالُوا سَبَرْنَا عَلَىٰ طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ وَسَبَرْنَا عَنْ مَعْسِيَةِ اللَّهِ We were patient with respect to doing wajibat. We were patient with respect to refraining from haram. Because you know, sabr has three branches. السَبْرُ عَلَىٰ طَاعَةِ السَّبْرُ عَنِ الْمُسِيبَةِ السَّبْرُ عَلَىٰ الْمُسْبَةِ Sorry, السَّبْرُ عَنِ الْمَعْسِيَةِ السَّبْرُ عَلَىٰ الْمُسِيبَةِ Patience for doing wajibat. Patience for avoiding haram, patience for musibah. They say, we had sab. Whatever Allah asked us to do, we did it with patience. Whatever Allah asked us not to do, we did it with patience. Hatta tabafanna Allah azza wa jal. Till we died, we were patient. Qalu antum kama gultum. The angel said, you are right. You are really patient. أُدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ فَنِعْمَ أَجْرُ الْعَامِلِينَ Go to heaven, what a good reward is there for the people who have done good actions. Another hadith is the last hadith here about patience. Ibn Abbas, rahmatullah alayhi, رضي الله عنه, You know, Ibn Abbas is a very respected, knowledgeable person. He says, لَمَّا دَخَلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَيْهِ عَلَى الْأَنْصَارِ 
فقال امؤمنون انتم and some of the people of Medina Rasulullah said are you mu'min are you believers for second they kept silent because it was not easy to say yes فَقَالَ رَجُلٌ نَعَمْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ One of them said yes. Messenger of God. They are mu'min. فَقَالَ وَمَا عَلَامَةُ إِيمَانِكُمْ Rasulullah said, what is the sign of your iman? He didn't say the sign of iman is that we declare, you know, shahadatain or we pray or we fast. He was aware that it's much more than this. He said, نَشْكُرُ عَلَى الرَّخَاءِ when there is ease, no problem, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَنَصْبِرُ عَلَى الْبَلَاءِ When there is calamity, we are patient. وَنَرْضَى بِالْقَضَاءِ And whatever Allah decides, we are happy. فَقَالَ مُؤْمِنُونَ وَرَبِّ الْكَعْبَةِ Rasulullah said, by the Lord of Kaaba, you are mu'min. You have shukr, gratitude, you have sabr, patience, and you are pleased with the decisions of Allah. So you are more. But those who are in high levels of iman and those who are muqarrab, <coughs> they are thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the time of ease and difficulties. This person said, we thank Allah at the time of ease. It means that we are grateful. But when there is difficulty, we are patient. Those who are in high levels of iman, those who are muqarra, they thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. Not only at the time of ease. In the month of Rajab, there is a dua, which is recommended to say after Salat. اللهم إني أسألك الصبر الشاكرين لك. I ask you the patience of the people who are grateful. If you are ill, if your child becomes ill, if you lose your child or any problem, you should thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Not only you should be patient. You should be patient, but also you should thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Because you know how much Allah is going to give you. In the Sajdah after Ziyarat Ashura, what do you say? Allahumma lakal hamdu, hamda shakirina laka ala musabhan. I praise you like the people who thank you for their musibah. Ash shakirina laka ala musabhan. Imam Hussein suffered a lot. But should he thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? You should thank Allah that Allah gave him this opportunity. Yeah? You should thank you for giving him this opportunity. You could have given this to someone else. And they designed up after all the tragedies of the day of Ashura, then said, Taqabban manna, oh Allah, please accept this from us. So, it's very important that if you really understand how much you are gaining, you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith says that Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said, نَحْنُ الصُبَّرْ وَشِيَعَتُنَا أَسْبَرُ مِنَّا Imam Sadiq said, we are patient, but our Shia are more patient than us. <laughs> This is very difficult to understand. We are patient and our Shia are more patient than us. But Imam himself explains. Because we are patient than us because we are more patient than us. Because we are patient and we know what Allah gives. What is going to happen? But they are patient and they don't know. Okay? Like for example, 
if you are taking your child for a walk, half an hour walk, your child, you know, keeps, you know, nagging and complaining, why we should walk, why we, you know, for example, don't take car, you know. You say it's good, it's a physical exercise, your body needs this exercise, half an hour. But he doesn't, you know, understand. So, who is in need of more patience? Your child. For you, although you have also the physical, you know, uh, pain, you become tired, but you understand this. And you don't want anyone, you know, to thank you for this. You yourself volunteer for this. <coughs> Even you don't expect any reward. You don't say, oh Allah, reward me because of my walking. You know, this is good for you. You say, oh Allah, thank you that today I was able to walk. Oh Allah, thank you that I was able to fast this month of Ramadan because I needed this for my spiritual health. Yeah? But those who don't have this understanding, they think they are doing a great thing and they need everyone to thank them, everyone to praise them. Yeah? So, those who have little, little knowledge, they suffer more. They need more patience. Those who are in higher level, they are very pleased and they thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma laka alhamdu, hamd al-shakareen laka, Allah You know, you have heard this story of Jabir. Jabir ibn Abdullah reached the position that when Imam asked him, how are you, how do you feel? He said, I am in a position that I prefer illness to health. I prefer poverty to richness. Because he had realized that suffering is better. But Imam said, we Ahlul Bayt are pleased with whatever Allah is pleased with. We don't say to Allah, give us bala or don't give us bala. We say, give us what is pleasing to you. If afia is pleasing, give us afia. Because for most of people, there is worry that if they don't have afia, they may lose their iman. You ask Allah, whatever you see is best for me, give to me. I think afia is better for me. But you know better. Ya wali al afia, nas'aluk al afia. We ask you afia. But you know better. Allah is wise. And if we leave things to Him, He never gives anyone musibah more than He can or she can cope with. <coughs> never Allah gives you more than what you can cope with. But when you go higher and higher, then maybe the tests become more difficult. If you are in the first year, the tests are easy. If you go to second year, the tests become more difficult. But everything is according to wise plan. Then don't test the one with the first year with the test of the one with the last year. Okay? But the test becomes more and more <laughs> difficult. Now there's a question. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards so much the people who suffer, even if this suffering is not done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, someone has been careless in driving and hit me and made me blind. All my life I'm blind. Allah is not responsible, but He is rewarding me. I have fever because there is <coughs> germ spread. But Allah rewards me for my fever. Why? <coughs> Why He should reward so much the people who suffer? Even this person didn't decide to suffer. It's not that he has volunteered himself for some difficult task. So I was thinking about this issue. Why Allah loves to reward the people who suffer? Then one example came to my mind. That... Imagine you are inviting some people to your house. You have some guests. What do you do if you have some guests? You do your best to make your guests feel happy and comfortable. Okay? If you are a real, you know, good host, you try that your guest feels quite well, 
at home, happy. So before guests come, you prepare. Then when your guest is there, you try to be at the level, you bring you know, good food, uh, fruit, everything. But unfortunately, your guest, when he wants to go to washroom, and washroom is in the second floor, falls down from the staircase and breaks his leg. What do you feel? You don't say, this is your problem, you should have been careful. My staircase was a standard and I had all the security <laughs> checking everything. <laughs> there is nothing wrong in my, you know, planning. No, no matter whether he was careless or someone pushed him or I don't know anything. Because this person suffered in your house, you feel very bad, you feel terrible. So you do your best so that this person would leave your house with happy memory. Or even if it is not possible to leave your house with happy memory because he has to go to hospital or whatever, <laughs> you do your best that you pay for the hospital, for everything, you send him later gifts, whatever, so that in future whenever he thinks about coming to you, he has good memory. Yeah? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treats us as his guests in this dunya. We are dependent on him. He has brought us in this dunya. And this dunya is under his lordship. Although it is not that everything happens is according to what he wants. There are many things that people do mis they do mischief or you know, these are natural regulations, limits, shortcomings. But still he says, this is my world. And my servant has suffered in dunya. So I will give him so much that he would be satisfied. When other people see that the one who has broken his leg is given so much, he says, I wish all our legs were broken. <laughs> but you cannot break your leg voluntarily, you know. <laughs> you say, okay, next time I go there, I make sure I break my leg. No. This is for the things that happen without your control. So if I say, I make myself blind because Allah looks after blind people. No. You have to look after your health. But if it happens that you lose your health, then Allah gives you so much that you will be satisfied. You have to work hard. But if you work hard and you become poor, no problem. But you cannot say, I sit at home and become poor because Allah rewards poor people. Okay? Everything is according to the wise plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, this world is not perfect, but it's the best possible physical world that could have been created. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with what He gives in Akhirah, He has perfect lordship for this dunya. He uses resources from other world to compensate for the shortcomings of this dunya. Okay? It's like, you know, we have a limited space, but we say, okay, don't worry, after that we go to a big place. And if you were not able to play here, you can play there. No <coughs> so he uses resources of other world to pay back for every shortcoming, every problem that happened in this world. Okay, now we move on to the unit three about human beings. <laughs> Among the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, human beings are the most important ones for us. <laughs> because we are human beings. So for us the most important creature of Allah to know are human beings. Not because we are necessarily the most important ones, but because for us the most relevant thing. We have to know. Therefore, if you read the Quran, 
The Quran talks about two subjects more than anything else. One is Allah, one is human being. It's the book of Allah for human beings. And Allah introduces himself to human beings and tells what he expects from human beings. So it's Allah and human beings. Allah is choosing human beings as his Khalifa. So the Quran is book of Allah. At the same time, the topic and the subject is Allah and human beings. The whole story is a story between Allah and human beings. Why he has created them, what he expects from them, how is he going to treat them. The Quran says that he has honored children of Adam. لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى كَثِيرًا مِمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا Allah says we have honored children of Adam and we have given them طَيِّبَاتِ pleasant nice blessings like food whatever we have made them able to move uh, in land or oceans this is very important and if you want uh, it is surah isra chapter 17 number 70 17 70 okay and Allah says, we raise them over many of our creation. <coughs> Not all. فَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرًا مَنْ خَلَقْنَا تَقْضِيلًا We have elevated them. We have raised them over many. كَثِير. Not جميع. Not all. We, human beings are raised over many of creatures. Not all creatures. Uh -huh. So the question is, are we Ashraf al makhluqat or not? In another place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَعْوِينَ We have created man in the best form. Or when he talks about creation of human beings, he mentions different stages that he says summa an sha'nahu khalqan akhar fa tabarakallahu ahsanul khaliq may allah be blessed the one with the best of creators so referring to the creation of man he says he is the best of creators so it means that our creation must be the best creation ahsan ta'wim the best form so are we the best creature or not it's the question. The answer is this. We are not the best creatures. But our creation is the best creation. When we are created, we are created in the best way, but still it is up to us to go and become actually the best. It's not that every human being by birth, by default, is the best. When you are born, you are in a very high position. You are better than many. But when you are born, you are not better than angels, for example. But Allah has created us in the way that we can finally become the best. Okay? So the creation is the best. Because it gives the creature the potential to upgrade and go and become actually the best. The example that uh, I always use is this. I say, imagine we have two factories or two production lines. One is to produce the fastest laptop. For example, if it is i7, we produce I7. <coughs> okay? The second production line produces I5. But 
inside there is a technique, new technique, that this laptop can graduate, gradually upgrade itself, become i7, i9, i11, i13. So when it comes from factory, it's i5. But there's a special technique that it can upgrade itself. So which one is more complicated? The second one. Although it is not the fastest at the moment, but it is the best. It's a technique. And this is used only for human beings and gems. These are the only creatures that we know that they have this freedom to upgrade themselves or degrade themselves or remain as they are. Either you remain in the same level that you are born with or you go higher or lower. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ فِي أَحْسَنَ تَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْوَلَ سَافِرِينَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّلَاةِ Okay? So, at the time of birth, we are better than many. But if you want to become the best, this is what you have to work yourself. Why? Do you know why? Because to become the best needs efforts. You cannot be the best without suffering, without testing, being tested and tried. You must have shahwa, you must have pressure for different mixed types of things. And if you remain pious and moral, you become the best. Angels cannot be always the best. Whether angels are best or not, it depends on us. If we fail, they become the best. If we act better, then they are the second best. Okay? So this is why before Adam was created, angels were the best. But Allah knew that they cannot become his Khalifa. So he created Adam, then Adam became the best. Do you understand? So, this is about the honor that Allah has given human beings. And for us Muslims, we don't have any problem about honoring human beings. We believe that human beings are very honored, they have karama, they have dignity, they have honor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we don't accept is the idea of some people, some humanists, that they want to honor human beings by separating them from Allah and making human beings center of everything which we believe is insulting human beings it's depriving human beings if you want to say no imagine like this if someone says this is this person this alim this marja is a great alim a great marja because he knows the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Okay? So you are honoring him. But you say, this marja, this alim is great, a scholar, he doesn't need Ahlul Bayt. He himself, mashallah, is so great. So are you honoring him or you are insulting him? <laughs> you are insulting him. <laughs> you know, you are damaging him. So mashallah, is so knowledgeable that he doesn't need to refer to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. So, if someone says human beings are so great that they don't need God, so they are taking away the most valuable thing that we have, and that is connection to Allah. Our value is in being Khalifatullah, representative of Allah. So, you if take Allah from me, so who am I representing? Allah says, Nafaktu fi himan ruhi. This spirit which is given to human beings is so valuable that Allah attributes to Himself. It doesn't mean that Allah has a spirit, He gives this spirit to us. He doesn't have a spirit. He is simple. It is human spirit that He calls Ruhi, to honor. This is Azafi Tashrifiyyah, to honor. Like we say, Kaaba is house of God. Ramadan is the month of God. Allah says, human spirit is Ruhi, is my spirit. Okay? Now, if you did 
detach and disconnect human beings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, if someone is a son of Rasulullah, then you say, I want to disconnect you from Rasulullah. So you're taking Ras uh, all the honor from him. So we have maximum respect for human beings, but not by comparing them to Allah or detaching them from Allah. Our honor comes when we are connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our honor, honor comes when we are servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, a servant has no identity of himself. You know, imagine if someone says, I am a minister. When this, we ask, for which government? He said, no government. <laughs> So what is the value of this minister? Even if you are a prime minister, for no government has no value. I am a policeman. For which police department? For which you know, country? No one. So who has given you authority? All the authority, all the identity comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can I ask a question about the Holy Spirit? Mm. Because uh, being used the word Ruhullah, for example, is the Spirit of God. It is one of the names of Khumain, Imam Khumain. So, also it's the name of Jesus Christ as well. Can you explain it further? What is this Ruhullah? What does it actually mean? Is it just a name? Or is it the one, because this people call Trinity, which is, I know it's bogus, but can you explain something about the Spirit of God? Uh, this uh, means some about very briefly. Uh, we have Ruhul Qudus, Holy Spirit, which is not a human being. Holy Spirit is a creature of Allah, but is greater than angels. Ruhul Qudus, but it's a creature. But then we have Ruhullah as a quality for some human beings, like Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam, Allah says in the Quran, wa He was the spirit of Allah. Why he was called Ruhullah? There are several explanations. One is because he was very spiritual. Another is because he was created by command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly without material conditions being fulfilled. He didn't have father. Rabbi. So those things which are created by command of Allah, they are Ruh. This Ru is different from a spirit of human beings. And another explanation is that Isa was Ruhallah because he was able to give life to Iznillah. He was making a statue of a bird and blowing to him blowing a spirit to it, then it becomes a bird. Okay, so it's like Ruh. He's giving Ruh. So, Isa alayhi salam was called Ruhullah for these reasons. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, just uh, within the paradigm that you mentioned, um, where do Aleen fit in? in where, do, where do the Aleen fit in into the paradigm that you mentioned now? Yeah, so Eliyin are those who are in very high level, some angels and also some human beings. The art of it. The they are very it. high level. And one interpretation of this ayah uh, that Allah says to Shaitan, Astakbarta and Kuntamin al Alin is were you arrogant or you were one of those Alin, those who were in that position? For sure, he was not one of them, so he was arrogant. He was a step. So, sorry, Ali. So, Ali <coughs> basically is the same arc of ascendancy that is allowed to, to human beings as well. Pardon? The same ascendancy or actualization that is allowed to human yeah, beings as so well. Those who have already achieved it. Yeah, so some angels and some human beings who are mukarra, very high, they are in early June. Right. So, second question, sir. You said the Quran is only about for between man and God. Essentially, which which is clear, mm -hmm. but the jinn, for example, in Surah Jinn, it seems from the statement of the jinn, Yahdi la they don't that they never got a book, and they themselves 
when they heard the Quran, they went towards the Quran, and they had no other book yeah. of so, their own. So they use our book. They do use our book. They use our prophets. So Allah sends prophets who are human beings, <coughs> but jinns can use the guidance that Allah has given to human beings. So that same guidance is available for yes, the, the same Quran guidance, and the Rasul. But they are not addressed directly. They are addressed through human prophets. Okay, so the value of human beings is very high, but this value comes with the connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have a radio or TV, but you disconnect it from a station, till the end of the life of this TV, it's not connected. So what is the value of this TV? It, it's just waste of you know, space. But when this is connected to the station, and then it becomes valuable. Okay, so this was about the value of human beings. Now, the values that we can achieve on top of the value that Allah has given us. There are some shared common values for all human beings, for which we don't get credit. Yeah. You cannot say, praise me because I'm a human being. Huh? I praise you for what you have done. Because uh, to be a human being is what Allah has given you. What are the things extra that you have? More than common shared, you know, values. Some people say, what I have extra is that I am white. Or I am yellow, or I am black, or whatever. You say, sorry, this is not uh, value. A human being by color doesn't become more valuable or less valuable. <coughs> Someone says, I come from a very noble family, rich family. No. The son of Nu, <coughs> the son of the Prophet, but has no value. <laughs> Someone says, I am man or I am woman. Gender doesn't have any specific value. So family, background, ethnicity, or for example, I come from west or east or north or south. I am from this side of river or that side of river. You know, sometimes people fight, you know, th those who are uh, upper, you know, side, they say, you know, we are better than the door. Are... The only thing that can make a human being better is the qualities which relate to our values to our moral system or to our understanding to our practice Quran says the most important quality is taqwa ya ayyuhan nas inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُ We have created you from one man and woman. Alhamdulillah, we are all brothers and sisters. Yeah? So, it is very good. Allah is our creator. And also we have the same father and mother. But He has made us into different tribes. He has given us different colors, different languages, so that we can know each other. If we were all looking the same and speaking the same language, it was difficult to identify each other. You know, If there were six billion people all looking the same and speaking the same language, it was difficult or maybe impossible to recognize and also boring. And it's very good that we have variety. We have different colors, different languages, you know. You know how many jobs were lost if people spoke the same language? All these dictionaries and language courses. <laughs> so, Allah has created us in different ways. So that you know each other. Not that because you say, I am superior. Inna akramakum and Allah atqaakum. The most honorable of you in the sight of Allah are those who are more pious, 
So taqwa is important. Color, gender, ethnicity, money, none of them are important. <coughs> and taqwa is something that you can achieve. I cannot change my color. I cannot change my gender. I cannot change, you know, my family background. It's not important. Taqwa, which is in your hand, is adding to your value. So, the Quran very much focuses on taqwa, and second, on knowledge. هَلْ يَسْتَوَ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Are those who know and those who don't know the same? يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَا دَرَجَاتِ Allah raises those who have iman and those who have knowledge raises them in ranks. Again, knowledge is something that you can achieve. It's not that some people automatically are born as alim, some are born as jahil. Again, knowledge is everyone uh, available to achieve. Something that is, even if you are poor, you can learn knowledge. Of course, if you are in more difficult condition for achieving taqwa and knowledge, Allah rewards you more and accepts from you more. A person who is brought up in a bad family, bad environment, if he is 10% muttaqi, can be better than a person who is 50% muttaqi, but he is in a very religious family, religious environment. <coughs> Maybe someone has learned a little knowledge, but even for this little knowledge he has a struggle. Someone has learned a lot, but he didn't struggle. What is important is how much effort he has put into this. The Quran says, لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى وَأَنَّ السَّعْيَهُ سَوْفَ يُرَى Allah doesn't look at your a'mal only. Okay, how many books you have written? No. How many mosques you have built? No. Allah says how much effort you have made. Maybe you built hundred mosques but you didn't struggle that much that a person who built one mosque struggled. You had lots of supporters, lots of money. But this poor guy for building one mosque, you know, died. <coughs> How many people have you guided? I guided millions of people. Another person guided only one person. Which one is better? We cannot judge. So, oh, this person is better. He has guided millions of people. <coughs> yeah, good. Yeah. You know, in Surah to walk here, yeah. we talk about people of the right hand and people of the left hand. Mm. But then there's a third group of people, the Sabiqun. Yeah. We say, Wa Sabiqun, as Sabiqun. Uh, who is this referring to? Is it to the Ahlul Bayt or is it to human beings? Okay. Ahlul Bayt, but it's not exclusive to Ahlul Bayt. Whoever is closer to Allah, they have gone to the level of Muqarrabun. As Sabiqun, as Sabiqun, Ulaik al Inshallah, we talk about Muqarrabun in Unit 7. If we manage to reach. Who are Muqarrabun? <laughs> so, the, yeah. What was I saying? No, Muqarrabun. No, no, before. Effort. Ah, someone has guided millions of people, another person has guided only one person. Which one is Muqarrab, which one is better? He cannot judge. Unfortunately, most of the time, we judge based on the quantity. Prophet Nuh was prophet. He was preaching for how many years? 950 years. His life was more, but 950 years prophethood. Okay? How many people were guided by him? Some 80 people. As average, every 12 years, one person was guided. If instead of Allah, any jama'ah, any community had, you know, made this contract with Prophet Nuh, after two, three years, cancelled him. <laughs> because it takes you 12 years to guide one person. 
We cannot work with you. So if Prophet Nuh was working for any community, <laughs> he would have lost his country. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different. Allah says, I know that you have done your best. So I keep the contract with you. Indeed, indeed, I have a special treatment for you. Why? Because all those people who see the result and the fruits of their amal, this gives them energy. You didn't get any energy from seeing success and still you continued. So I give you a promotion. You are now Ulul Asma. Not only you remain as a prophet, I put you among five most outstanding prophets. Because you have determination. No one listened to you and you kept preaching. It's not easy. Imagine if you are in the community for 10 years and only one person comes to the mosque. You give up. But he didn't give up. I said, what is important is that I do my best. So Allah raised him to the level of Ulul Asma. So, لَيْسَ insan إِلَّا مَا سَعَى Your efforts are important. أَنَّ السَّعَيَّهُمْ سَوْفَ يُرَى You will see your efforts. You will see your a'mal. But the value of a'mal is based on how much energy, how much effort you put into it. Sorry, what is the reference of this verse? It's uh, Surah Naj, verse 39. Uh, Surah Naj means chapter 53. So, verse 39. And Laysa bin Sa'allah Masa'a, verse 40. Wa anna sa'ayahu so fayyura. Or, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa man arad al akhirah. Surah Isra. Number 19. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا فَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ فَأُولَاكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا Those who want akhirah and make efforts while they are mu'min, Allah will thank him. Allah is grateful. Or for example, Allah says, Surah Nazarat, verse 35, يَوْمَ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانُ مَنْ مَا سَعَى Man remembers the efforts that he has made. So, human beings are judged according to what they have achieved themselves and based on how much effort they have put. Taqwa is what I should achieve. Knowledge is what I can achieve. What my father or grandfather had, it's good for them. But for me, it's my taqwa and my knowledge which can help me. Okay? Yes. If I have taqwa, if I have knowledge, then connection with other people can help. For example, if you are a sayyid and muttaqi, this taqwa gives value to sayyids more. But if a Sayyid is not Muttaqi, he is even worse than a non-Sayyid. A Sayyid who does bad things, of course we should respect all the Sayyids as much as possible, but in the sight of Allah, he is worse than normal people, because he has destroyed the reputation of Sayyids. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Nisa an Nabi, lastunna ka ahadan na Nisa, in If you are Muttaqi, you are not like normal women. And if you are bad, مَنْ يَعْتَمِنْ كُنَّ بِفَاحِشَةً يُضَعَفْ لَهَا الْعَذَابِ Azab is multiplied because of the connection. So, no one can say, I am better because I am Sayyid or I am Arab or Pars or uh, I don't know, any uh, background, ethnicity background. No. Taqwa, knowledge, but a 
again, this taqwa and knowledge is, are measured according to the efforts. Maybe you have more taqwa, but you are in a very comfortable and convenient setting. You don't struggle for this taqwa. Someone has struggled for this taqwa. Or maybe someone had access to lots of ulama, books, libraries, courses, another person struggled. Someone was studying in the ground floor, someone had to go to the basement. So, <laughs> <laughs> so everything is taken into account. What is important is that you should not give up. <laughs> Do your best. Okay, so the criteria for values and measuring the value of human beings is what they have done themselves, what they have achieved themselves. Yes? Can I just ask a question, if you don't mind? I think yes. it's relevant time, otherwise at some point. Sure. What obstructs us um, in being guided? Because we talked about Sitra. Yes. Um, so Prophet News time, 900 years. What stopped people from being guided, although a prophet was among them? Because, you know, human beings are free. And you cannot predict what they do. Sure. Sometimes they respond. Sometimes they don't respond. Sometimes there are mischief makers among them that stop them responding. You know, they ask everyone not to listen, not to follow. There are distractions. So you can never predict what is going to be response. Even sometimes two people are in the same condition. One of them responds positively, one of them doesn't. You have sometimes children of the same family. One of them is very good, very nice, another person is very, you know, naughty and, you know. So, you can never predict human beings, because they're free. You can do your best, but at the end that person must decide. Therefore, Allah never asked the prophets, how many people have you guided? No, this is not a good question. You know, sometimes people, for example, say, how many people have you guided? How many people have you converted? This is not a good question. Did you deliver the message properly or not? Did you act properly or not? Then whether people responded or not, it's their responsibility. They have to answer to Allah for that. I cannot answer for what they are supposed to do. Yeah? How many people listen to you? They have to answer to Allah. What Allah asked me is that as an alim, as a guide, did you perform your job properly? Did you prepare yourself? Did you show patience? Did you show good akhlaq? Did you make yourself available? These are the things that I have to observe. But what people respond is their responsibility. It's not my. But unfortunately, we always judge people according to factors which are not in their hands. That's why I wanted to ask you, Sheikh. I mean, you've already answered the question. My question, this question, I'm going to ask all, uh, partly in terms of effort. But let's say you have a child. So you know the predisposition of lineage. Yeah. There's always a genetic predisposition of specific lineage as well. A child that is born out of wedlock, in a completely, uh, you know, an, an environment where God does not even figure. Now that child. Growing up in that environment, and you know, we see, you know, there, there are many examples, and we see that child doesn't have the opportunity. You know, that predisposition is always going to be towards evil. evil. That's why, you know, in terms of committing crimes, you know, small, small, from truancy to, to crime, and there are many examples within society where we see they start with truancy, they go on to crime, and then they're stuck in something that they don't even know any better. How, I mean, I know there's an element of effort involved in trying to come out of that. But isn't that predisposition already weighing them down? No. It makes it difficult for them, but it's not impossible. And if they do even little things, Allah helps them more than He helps other people. You know, if someone in a difficult condition does very little, Allah helps them more, much more than other people. So they can find Allah very close to them, if they go to Allah, more than other people. Yes. 
So, in Islam, the most important qualities that we can achieve is taqwa and knowledge. Yes. Sorry, um, just um, if that illegitimate child, for example, puts in the same amount of effort as someone who is not, uh, who is who is born only, mm. or <coughs> someone who says is saved, would the achievement, the reward, be the same, or would that, you know, his birth prevent him from receiving the reward that another person would get? No, no. Indeed, he will be rewarded more. Mm -hmm. okay. If someone is illegitimate and does equal good as someone who is legitimate, he will be rewarded more. Because for him it was more difficult. Even like the position of a Sayyid, the effort of a Sayyid... If people listen just this part, you know, then they, they will misunderstand. <laughs> but I hope everyone listens to the whole lecture. So, <laughs> if a person who is brought in bad family, bad environment, uh, bad background, <coughs> does equal good, Allah rewards him more. Because afzal al-a'mal ahmazuha. The best of actions are those who are done with more difficulties. And say the non say if their um, effort is the same, can they achieve the same? Or will they say those is not If efforts are the same, the reward can be different, but the thing is that because the responsibility was also more. You know what I'm saying? So if you have a big responsibility, so that responsibility can be a credit, also can be also a kind of burden. If you manage to carry out your responsibility in a good way, it can be good for you. Otherwise, it can be bad for you. So there's a balance. Now we move on to the discussion about soul. Human beings are not only this physical body that we see. Because we are so much used to this body, you know, every time we open our eyes we are seeing ourselves. Even when we close our eyes we are feeling, you know, our body. So we think that it's only this body. We think that we are identical with body. But we are more than this body. This is a very smooth. Although our body in its creation is magnificent. All the organs that Allah has created for us are magnificent. But compared to the spirit is nothing. The human spirit is a great world. أَتَزْعَمُ أَنَّكَ جَرْمٌ صَغِيرٌ وَفِيكَ انْتَبَ الْعَالَمُ الْأَكْبَرُ This poem is attributed to Imam Ali, but some people say it was another Ali or Nabi Talib, not Imam Ali. Anyway, but the concept is good. Whether it is Imam Ali or someone else. Do you think that you are a small physical mass? No. Inside you is العالم الأكبر, the greatest world. Even some mystics say the world that you see, this whole earth, sun, moon, this is alam asqa. This is a smaller world. The world of spirit is greater. Because this whole world was not able to undertake the amana of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna aradna al amana ta'ala samawati wal ardi wal jibar. This Mount Himalaya said, I cannot carry this Rahman. Of course, because they were also humble. You know, out of humbleness, not out of arrogance. Not because they were lazy, you know, saying, no, I, I cannot do this, I am busy. They said, you know, it's too much for us. They were honest. Pacific Ocean said, I cannot take this amana, I am too little. And Ensan took this amana. 
But unfortunately, in Nahu Kana, Zaluman Jahula. After a son took this Amana, then unfortunately they did Zul and they were ignorant. Except the people that Allah then excludes later, the, the Mu'mineen who fulfill the requirements. So we have capacity to accept amana of Allah and no one else can this, accept this. But there is a hadith of Qudsi which is saying that لا يسعني أرضي ولا سماء Neither my earth nor a sky can contain me. ولكن يسعني قلب عبدي المؤمن but the heart of a believing servant can contain me. So our heart has unlimited capacity. But this capacity is to be built. It's not that when you are born you have this unlimited capacity. Some people, their capacity is like a cup of you know, tea. Even little things you know, can make them you know, nervous. Some people, their capacity is like ocean. Nothing can disturb them. What is important is that the creation is in the way that you can grow and grow, expand and expand. There is no limit. But it's not given to you at the time of birth. You have to build this capacity. Alam nashrah laka sabra. For Rasulullah, this was there. Prophet Musa said, Rabbish rahli sabri. Please expand my breast. Yes. This amount of the God gave, what is this amount of this gave to the world and they refuse and they mean to What is this amount of this? Could, yeah. I, could I add, just add, add sure. that same question? So, number one, what is this amount Number two, the, this Zaluman Jahula is not a chastisement for accepting the amount <laughs> No. It's, no, it's not chastisement. It's, for not, for, it's not for accepting This is the way we practiced. Right. And thirdly, I didn't take the amount. Why am I giving it? I don't remember taking it. That's my third question. <laughs> Yes. This amana is explained in uh, different ways, but all of them are connected, so <coughs> not uh, making any difficult. This amana is the amana of being Khalifatullah, to be able to represent Allah, to be vice president of Allah on the earth which requires freedom, because some people say amana is freedom. But we can say it is requirement of amana. Or for example, Quran. Again, Quran is the message that we need for being Khalifatullah, revelation. So, no one other than human beings was able to be Khalifatullah. But, has every human being reached the position of being Khalifatullah? No. Many of them shed blood. And this is what angels were seeing. But there was no other solution. We needed to have human beings with freedom, with infinite capacity, so that some of them at least reach this level of carrying this amana. Of course, all of them could be good. There is no reason why, you know, they must be bad. No. But in reality, unfortunately, many people fail. Okay? So, when Allah says, Inna It doesn't mean that Allah asked them in a meeting, whoever is ready, you know, uh, sign this contract. No, it means that we measured the capacity that they have. And we realized that they didn't have capacity for this. Only human beings had capacity for this. Therefore, this task was given to them without asking them formally or in a meeting. Allah knew our capacity. But human beings not fulfilled necessarily the requirements. إِنَّهُ كَانَ لَلُومًا جَهُوبًا Sometimes they did zulm, sometimes they did ignorant actions, unwise actions. But these are not fixed. 
It can be avoided. Therefore, we have human beings who are uh, uh, good and who actually manage to uh, undertake this amana of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so human beings have a soul, have a spirit, which has unlimited capacity. But again, I emphasize, this unlimited capacity is not necessarily there actually. It means that you can grow and build. You know, uh, another example, of course, in a different way, is Jahannam. How many people can be put in Jahannam? There is no limit. <coughs> if you put hundreds of billions of people, still Jahannam has a space. Okay? But does it mean that Jahannam is made so big, so Allah has to fill it? Because, you know, لَأَمْلَأَنَّ Jahannam. So, is Allah going to fill it because there are so many spaces, so by force? No. Jahannam is made in the way that it can grow. So, it is a small, but the more you put, the more it becomes. It's like, you know, plastic, growing. Therefore, when Allah says, يَوْمَ نَقُولُ لَجَهَنَّمْ حَلِمْ تَلَعْتْ We say to Jahannam, are you not full? It says, وَحَلْ مَنْ مَزِي It doesn't say I'm full or not. Because he says, if there is more, I can grow. <laughs> so, maybe inshallah Jahannam will be full only with few people. Not even thousands. We hope that more, you know, will go to heaven and let's go to Jahannam inshallah. But the thing is that Jahannam has the capacity. Okay? The capacity. But the capacity is not made so then the we waste stage. The capacity can be built gradually. Anyway, human soul has capacity for good or bad. You can be worse than animals. Even maybe I think some human beings can become worse than shaitan. Some human beings maybe teach shaitan. You know? <laughs> there are things that you know, some human beings do that maybe shaitan even didn't think about it. <laughs> There is no limit for our badness, and there is no limit for our goodness. But this is coming gradually, so it's potential. It's not necessarily every human being has been given infinite capacity, but it means that it can be grown. So, one of the important things about human beings is this infinite capacity. No one has this infinite capacity. Even angels, they have fixed. Quran says, وَمَا مِنَّا إِلَّا لَهُ مَقَامٌ مَعْلُومٌ All the angels have a very known and fixed position. Jibra'il cannot become better than what he is. With all the respect that we have for Jibra'il, it's not a sign of weakness. Anyway, it's not possible for Jibra'il to become better. Or for example, Mikhail cannot say, I work harder because I want to be in the place of Jebra'il. No. There is no way for them to become better or to become worse. In Hadith Gisai, it's mentioned Jebra'il to ask God for permission to go and join with the fight, with the sick, yeah. and God allowed him. Yeah. Did he get elevated by that? No. Because uh, uh, then Hadith uh, the no, you read love, uh, you read uh, in my, you read love, you just want to reach a little bit ahead with the tea that came after that. So, can you explain that, please? What they do doesn't make them better. Uh -huh. But these things are all to be taken into account to understand their position. But how do they become so, Ali? Pardon? How do they become Ali? How do they They are created in that way. Mm -hmm. They are created in that way, and part of it, what they can benefit from the Hujjah of Allah. I'm not denying that they can benefit, but that is taken into account from the beginning. 
So they don't have like us test. You know, for uh, for us we have test. Good or bad or multiple, you know, choice. For them there is no test because always they go for good things. They always go for right and moral decisions. The same is with other creatures. For example, animals. Animals have fixed position. A horse cannot become a better horse. A more pious horse, more moral horse. A horse is a horse. Cat is cat, dog is dog. They are changed, uh, they are fixed, not changeable. But if it comes to human beings, you have ability to become like Musa, Ibrahim, Isa, Prophet Muhammad, you can become like um, Pharaoh, Namrud, Hitler. So the difference is too much. As if they are not the same creation. You know, it's very difficult to call Namrud human being and Ibrahim also human being. The difference is too big. This shows you know, how much human beings can be uh, different. The spectrum is very wide. From A'la Illiyin to Asra al It's very big. Even Mullah Sadra has the idea that indeed human beings are not one species. There are many, many. So, there is infinite capacity in us, for good or for bad. But the angels, because they, que because they, can, they can think, and because they can question, yeah. they must have some degree of determination. Yeah. They have some degree of determination which makes them excel or, or fall. But determination in them is natural, because they do what is essential for them. Determination in, in us is very fundamental, very important, because we have different options. But for them, determination is natural, because they don't have any other thing to do. But they can think and they can question. You know, if, if sugar is sweet, does it mean that it has determination? We can say it has determination, but it is natural, it's essential. Some, some scholars, from, especially from the other schools, say that the angels wanted to become the Khalifa instead of man. We don't no. believe in that. No, no, I think uh, our time is uh, over, so inshallah we continue after Salat. <laughs>
But what makes our reality is soul. And this is why even after departing the body, soul remains the same and the person has the same identity. This happens at the time of death, when soul departs from this body. But even in dunya, sometimes this can happen. You know, when we sleep, Allah says, Allah yatawaffal anfusahina mawtaha wallati lam tamut fi manamiha. Those who die, Allah takes away their soul, receives them. But those who have not died, when they sleep, your soul is taken. But partially. A still soul has some connection to run and manage the body, but soul is somehow released. And this is why the soul can have some rest. Or the soul can have access to the higher realms of reality. Sometime in your sleep, you have a dream that you understand things that you didn't know when you were awake. Sometimes you have dream of future. Many of you must have had this experience that you have dreamt of something which is happening in the future. At least you must have heard from people around. Sometimes people have dream of a place that they have never been and they have never seen, they have never watched a movie or anything. They have a dream of a place, when they go there they find it exactly the same. So, this is because the soul was able to depart partially this world and get access to the levels of knowledge of Allah which are the tablets or alwah as we call. We are not saying every dream is true because sometimes we have adghas wa ahlam. Sometimes there are dreams which are baseless. For example, when we sleep, our mind goes to the archive and plays with the images which are stored in the archive. So something that I have seen two years ago, another thing three years ago, another thing today, mix them up and then makes a movie. <laughs> when I watch that movie. This may have no reality. Maybe you dream, you have dream of your passed away father or grandfather. This doesn't mean necessarily you have had encounter with the soul of Marhum. But sometimes it's possible. When there is true dream, your soul gets access to the soul of those people. And you can be informed about the things that you had no way to know when you were awake. The story of Prophet Yusuf is very special. Allah taught Prophet Yusuf the ability to interpret dreams. And this helped him when he was in prison and Pharaoh was in need of someone to interpret, as you know the story. His dream was so important that his future and future of the people of Egypt all was dependent on that dream. But who had that dream? Not necessarily a good person. The dream was the dream of Pharaoh. Yeah? So sometimes even a bad person may have a good dream, a true dream. Because if anyone other than Pharaoh had that dream, Pharaoh was not taking it serious. Yeah? If someone, you know, from public or even some of the people who worked for their own, they said, we had this dream, seven uh, thin uh, cows eating seven fat cows. Then Pharaoh was not bothering about this. So he had himself this dream, he took it very serious, and Prophet Yusuf uh, gave him the interpretation which was convincing, and a nation was saved and many people were guided because of that dream. So this is because soul is able 
to depart from body at the time of sleeping and get access to those realities. Sometimes even people who are not sleeping, they have ability to have encounter with the soul of Marhumin. Allama Tabatabai had a brother who was a very pious person. And his brother had a student who was able to get in touch with the spirits of the dead people. And through him, he was communicating to great ulama, great philosophers, even to great philosophers in uh, ancient Greece. He was communicating, having philosophical discussions with them. His student was not himself understanding, but he was facilitating this encounter. So it's possible. Again, I say not that everyone who claims is honest and genuine. You have to be careful. But in principle, it's quite possible. During the dream or when you are awake, you can have access to the ruh or spirit of the marhumin. During your dream or when you are awake, you can see places that you have never been there. It is possible. There are people who have ability to communicate. Even when they are awake, telepathy. So a person here communicates with another person without using any mobile or internet. There are people who have this ability. They can have communication with each other. To some extent, we see this sometimes in mothers. Sometimes when a child who lives away has a problem, immediately mother feels the problem. At the same time. And later when they check, they say, it was at that time that I had a problem. Or many times, for example, uh, I call my mother, this happens a lot. She says, I was thinking of you. In the same time that she was thinking, I called her. So there is a kind of connection between the souls. These cannot be explained by rules of physics. That why these two bodies, if we are only physical body, why these two 70 kilograms of meats and bones <laughs> have this type of communication? Why these concerns are shared? Why this person can see something which has not happened yet? There are people who have ability to move or change things in distance. There are people who are here and they move an object in the end, end of the room. They can bend a spoon, they can you know, bend uh, folk, they can move objects, they can bring you something from another place. These are possible. This is not a sign of being a, a special person. Sometimes they learn. Sometimes they have this naturally. There are people who are born with this. Even there are people who have bad power. They cannot do anything good, but they can cause problems. You know, for example, if they praise you, then you have problems. You know, say, you are very beautiful. Then the same day, you know, you have a scar on your face. <laughs> Sometimes this also happens. So, there are many experiences, even for ordinary people, that show that we are not only a physical object. We have a very important aspect, which is much greater. You know, like iceberg. What you see is only the surface. What is greater is not seen. No one sees what is in the water, you know, it's greater. We see only a little. Indeed, Quran says the whole dunya is just like surface of an iceberg. And akhira and the world of spirits is under. Ya'lamuna zahiran min al-hayat al-dunya. 
They see only the out outward aspect of dunya. وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ But with respect to the akhirah, they are heedless. So means akhirah is bottom. Zahir is dunya. Akhirah is bot. Is inward. Body is zahir. Ruh is bottom. We only see the surface. Sometimes when we look at a person, we think that because he looks good, he's a good person. Not necessarily. Yes, it is true that good people also good look, uh, look good. But it's not always the same. Maybe a person looks very nice, but he's a bad person. Because the surface. The beauty of people is to be seen in their ruh, in the soul, in their heart. Not just the surface. Yeah? Like a car, which is nicely painted and everything looks nice, but has no engine. My engine is broken. So there are human beings who look nice. They have used lots of perfume, everything, you know, soap, everything. Uh, uh, shower. So they look very nice. But inside is dirt. But we don't see. We think, oh, this is a very nice person. In addition to these dreams, uh, telepathy, and I don't know, encounter with the souls, there are also some other experiences that can help. There is a concept in Islamic philosophy and spirituality, we call it voluntary death. Voluntary death, which means you decide yourself that you want to die. It means that you decide to depart your soul from your body. Sometimes this happens for people on occasions. Sometimes people can do it any time they want. In the book Self-Knowledge, I have mentioned some of these examples in the chapter about the spirit. There was an alim in Mashhad who passed away a few years ago, Ayatollah Mirza Jawad Agha Tehrani. He was a very pious man and I met him. He has a book to refute the ideas of Marxists because Marxists were materialists. So, to refute their ideas, Ayatollah Mirza Jawad Agha Tehrani brings many arguments to prove that spirit is abstract or immaterial. But he refers to one of his own experiences, which is very nice. He says, I myself have had this experience of my soul departing my body. What happens to these people is that, like you seeing your dress hanging, imagine you have gone home and you put your dress on a hanger, okay? You see your, for example, Abba or Chador or whatever. These people see their body like this. It means that they have gone out of the body and now they can look at body. Like I am seeing your body now. They can see their own body. He says, I have had this experience. And many people have had this, but I quote from him because he's a great alim and reliable. There is a story about Hakim Haydaji. Hakim this is a, a story mentioned in Ma'at Shanasi by Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Tehrani. Hakim Haydaji was a very learned alim, philosopher, and he was in Najaf, sorry, in Tehran. And he, in his philosophical ideas, he had this concept that for people it's not possible to die voluntarily. He was against this. Therefore, he used to bring arguments against this concept. 
One day, when he was in his room, a very simple man from village, you know, like looking at someone from village, maybe he has no education, something like this, went to him. And after salam, he said, why do you deny voluntary death? Hakim Haydadi was surprised, you know, a simple man is coming and asking him philosophical questions and, you know, questioning him. So he said, this is our discipline, this is our field, this is our scholarship. We have arguments, you know. So that man, all of a sudden, lie down on the floor and died. As if he has died for tens of years. Hakim Hidaji was very frightened. This man has died here. Now people think that we have killed this man in our madrasa. And people you know, from government, you know, police, you know, they create troubles for us. So he called the talabe and you know, caretaker, everyone, that we should you know, get ready for all the funeral, everything. After some time, that man said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and sat. Sat up. So Hakim was very shocked and told him, you have killed me. Why you did this with me? Then that man said, I wanted to let you know that these are the things that you cannot only understand by learning. This is possible. I wanted you to see. But this needs salatul layl. This needs tahajjud. This needs ibadah. It's not only a matter of studying. So Hakim changed from that time. He spent some of his time on teaching and studying and some of the time on ibadah. And he never married. He stayed in madrasa. Always, you know, in the madrasa. And the day he was supposed to die, he was aware. He informed people beforehand that tomorrow you are seeing that I am dying. He made a wasiya, and in his wasiya he says that, I have his wasiya in, in front of me, he says that because of my death, please don't trouble anyone. I don't want anyone to feel, you know, obligated or obliged to attend. And then he said, my friends should be sure that I am going from the prison of dunya to a better world towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, I wish I had money to give to my friends to celebrate, to have a feast after I die. Because this is the night of Vesal. This is the night that I am meeting my beloved. It's like a kind of wedding. So there is no need to cry for me. So in the morning, he woke up like normal for Salat al -Layl. Then he went on the top of the madrasa for Azan. He said Azan. Then he went back to his room. He said Salat al -Fajr, and never came out. When sun was rising, they went and he was dead. So, it's possible to have voluntary death. Someone decides that the soul leaves the body. For us, this is not possible. Why? Because our soul is so much used to body, so much attached to body, that even we don't think we are anything other than body. How can I depart this and even when at the time of death, by force they want to separate me from body, still I resist. And it, this makes death very really difficult, because I don't want to lose <laughs> this body. It's like, you know, when a fruit is not uh, ripe, if you want to, you know, pick up, the whole tree wants to break. But when it is ripe, it comes down quickly. So for some people, death is more painful than removing the nails. 
You know how difficult it is to remove the nail? It's very painful. If you want to remove, you know, a skin of someone. For some people, death is more difficult than that because they are too much attached to this body. They cannot think of anything other than this body. For some people, death is nothing. It's just changing a dirty dress. Who is hesitant to change a dirty dress? Everyone wants to get rid of this dirty dress. So, soul departs body at the time of death, but can also partially depart the body at the time of a sleeping or at the time of voluntary death. And our reality is based on the soul. Our good character, our good qualities, bad qualities, all depend to the soul, relate to the soul, depend on the soul. Therefore, if you can have some transplantation, bring the body of a bad person and use it for a good person, that person doesn't become a bad person. If you put the eyes of a bad person into the head of a good person, that person doesn't become a bad person. You know, it is said that in every six years, our cells are changed. But we are not changed. Only nervous system, the cells don't change. Otherwise, the rest, they are changing all the time. But we are not changed. A very good philosophical argument, very simple one, which is mentioned in the book, is the argument from unity of our personality. Over time, we become older. We become, I don't know, for example, bigger. You know, sometimes we put on weight on ourselves. But my understanding of myself doesn't change according to body. I am the same person. If I was 50 kilograms and now I have become 80 kilograms, I don't feel that 60% is my ego bigger or my spirituality is bigger. Or if God forbids there is an accident, someone's legs are cut off, he doesn't feel that he has lost part of himself. Yeah, the understanding that we have of ourselves is not according to the size of the body. If you lose your legs and hands, still you are the same person. There are also other arguments, like arguments based on knowledge. Knowledge cannot be a quality of the material things, because material things have no awareness of what is happening around them. Even they don't have awareness of themselves. For example, if I have a piece of paper, this side of paper doesn't know what is on the other side. What does it mean to say that this is aware of what is the other side? Or this paper, what does it know about the other paper? Two material objects cannot have any awareness of each other or even of themselves. But we human beings have awareness. We know things which are around us, we know ourselves. Knowledge is not a quality of matter or physical objects. Especially we can have knowledge of something after tens of years without change. Material things change, but our knowledge doesn't change. So, human beings are a combination of soul and body. But soul is the most important part. Soul is the one that makes our reality. And this is why in the Quran, when Allah talks about death, He says, death is tawaffi. Tawaffi means to take something completely. When soul is taken, it means that the whole person is taken. Allah yatawaffa al-anfus. So nafs, is the same as self. When soul is taken, means everything is taken. Because body is not important. Sometimes people ask, you know, what happens on the day of resurrection when a person 
has been buried and his body became soil and then the soil was eaten because it became like grass by a sheep. The sheep was eaten by another person. Then what was part of the body of a good person is now part of the body of a bad person. So this is going to be punished or rewarded. There are many answers to this. But one important and easy answer is that it's not important to which body it belongs. What is important is the soul. You can create body from anything. You can take only one cell and clone the whole body. It's not important. What is important is the soul. And soul of each person never becomes part of the soul of another person. Body is not important. As I said, body is all the time changing. So the reality of us is made with our soul. Now, we have some questions about body and some questions about soul uh, to, inshallah, address in this unit. Yes. So if, if the body is not important in that sense, what is the problem with organ donation after you die? Because um, from my knowledge, we're not supposed to donate our organs. Body is not important as such, but because of the soul, body becomes important. So, you cannot harm your body. You cannot say, body is not important, I want to injure my body. No. This is body of a human being. And therefore, this body must be respected, even after departure of the soul. You know, in Islam, we cannot even harm body of dead people. If I get chance, there's a very beautiful discussion, unfortunately, I may not get chance, that it is haram to do to the body of a dead person what is haram to do with the body of a living person. For example, if a person is alive, I cannot remove his eyes. The same is with a dead body. And even more, I have to pay dear blood money if I do something to a dead body that would have killed him if he was alive. For example, if there is a dead person, I remove his heart. If he was alive by this, I would have killed him. Now I have to pay blood money. How much is different and if you want, I have a paper about value of life in Islam or Islamic bioethics. You Google and you find it. I mentioned the beautiful hadith from Imam Qasim alayhi salam. If I get chance, inshallah, I will explain. Therefore, in Islam, we cannot uh, let people investigate body of a dead person unless there is a very important reason, like there is a suspicion of murder. Or, for example, if there is need for medical training and there is no way to find body of a dead person who is not a, a believer and we do it to the minimum. So these are emergencies. Otherwise, you cannot just say, okay, these are dead people, you know, a start, you know, opening up their heart, you know, as much as you like, you know, to learn uh, to the minimum. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. The thing is, uh, we, we have a problem here because uh, we have people who need kidney transplants. Yeah. And uh, the Sharia allow a dead person's caliber kidneys to be used for, because there's so many people in our community yeah. who are really paid and they need this. So that is one of the emergencies, to save someone's life. But then you see we have a nation before the person is going to pay you, so that you can retrieve it. Yeah. So in the paper I have discussed transplantation in three scenarios. One is when he's alive, one is after death, one is in the state of brain death. So there are three scenarios, each of them has to be discussed separately. But briefly, when somebody is alive, you cannot remove any part of his body that would put his life into risk. So if it's one kidney, he can have a good life, it's no problem. 
indeed, uh, some of Maharaja say, if he can have a good life and it is the only way to save someone else's life, you must donate to save that life. But I cannot say, please take my heart and give it to this person. He's a nice person. I want to die and you know, give my heart to him. I cannot. Because this is putting my life into an end. Okay? But I can donate something which would not put my life into danger or risk or doesn't create unbearable problems. After I die, there is no problem. If I have made in my will or the guardians decide to give my heart to someone who needs my heart to be saved. That is possible. The main controversial area is brain death. And because normally our ulama don't accept brain death as death, so they don't permit. They don't permit to remove the essential parts of body in the state of brain death. But uh, if I get time, I will explain more what is happening in Iran, you know, how uh, legal, you know, arrangement uh, is done. We can talk about it, inshallah. Yes. Um, you mentioned brain death uh, because there are some neurological examples where either due to trauma or other condition, a person may not be completely brain dead, but their understanding of themselves does change. Yeah. So this can be used maybe as an example of how the body... No, this cannot be used because body is important for our understanding. But what is important at the end, it is the soul that understands. So even if we know that, for example, when this part of brain is damaged, this person's memory goes away, for example. Or when this part of brain is damaged, he cannot see things. This doesn't mean that it is the brain who understands. It is the soul that understands. But our soul, according to is uh, said, you know, Muslim philosophers have said it very beautifully. They said the soul is immaterial in essence, but for functions needs body. Our soul acts through body till it becomes independent. When it has not become independent, it is limited to body. For example, I cannot see what is behind my head. Does it mean that my soul is material? No. My soul has no front or back or whatever. But my soul is weak. Therefore, it depends on my body. When I don't have physical encounter with something, I cannot see it. But if the soul becomes independent and releases herself from body, for soul there is nothing like front or back. Everything is the same for soul. So we need brain, definitely we need brain for our understanding, but the actual understanding is action of soul, not brain. So human body is to be respected even after departure of the soul. You have to bury with respect in a very nice place. You cannot bury someone in, uh, uh, for example, in a dirty place with respect. You cannot damage the body of a dead person. Even before soul is created and born, human body must be suspected. You know, we believe that soul is given or created around four months, after four months, 120 days. But you cannot say, because soul is not yet created, so we abort the child. No. From the first day that pregnancy starts, this body has to be respected. Because this is the body that can become at the service of a human soul. So, human body is important, is respected, but the value is for soul and then extended to body. One of the qualities of our soul, which is very important, is freedom. 
Human beings can choose between different options. This free will is very important. Sometimes people say, we are not free because we do whatever society tells us, whatever, I don't know, um, parents tell us. They think we are forced. But the answer is no. Although they can have some role, but you can be working against the will of the society, either for good reason or for bad reasons. Sometimes the people work against the will of society because they are criminals. Sometimes they are reformers. There was a time that people used to have a slavery. It was common. But there were some people who stood against a slavery. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived in a society which was full of corruption. But Rasulullah didn't follow the norms of society. He changed the society. So if society is forcing, so why some people can change the society? Or there are people who follow their parents and there are many people who don't follow their parents. Either for good reason or bad reason. Sometimes parents are bad, they want to be good. Sometimes parents are good, they want to be bad. You can be wife of Pharaoh and be a good person. You can be son of Nu and be a bad person. It's up to you. Yes. One question I have. Now, supposing is there a girl is being tainted and she gets pregnant and she's going to die. Is it in her right to remove the baby so that the, uh, what, what is her teaching in religion? Supposing she, that she is out of, uh, she has been yeah, subjected to danger. Then what would happen to that child? Yeah, of course they should ask a marajah, but uh, in general, according to our fiqh, there is a ground, but we should check with the marja of each person. But there is a ground that if it is in the early stage of pregnancy and keeping the baby would lead to usro haraj, means some unbearable difficulties, abortion can be permitted. But in the early stage, before the soul is created. For example, in the first month. There are some marajah who give this fatwa, but one has to check with his marja. Because before the soul is created, it's not yet a human being. Abortion is haram, but before the soul is created, the intensity of horma is less. So, for example, if the life of mother is at serious risk in first month, to second month, abortion can take place. But after four months, we have a human being. Then here it's very difficult to permit abortion, even if the life of mother is in risk. Unless we are 100% sure that if we don't do anything, both of them will die. So... These are general rules, but again, everyone for practice should refer to his marja or her marja. So, freedom is a very important aspect in human beings. They can exercise this freedom against the will of society, parents, community, whatever. But, our freedom is not 100%. There are many things that are not in our hands. First of all, we didn't decide to come to this world. Although, if we were given the chance, we would have decided. But now we have not decided. I haven't decided to be man or woman. I haven't decided to be born into this family or that family. This part of the world or that part of the world. This generation or previous or next generation. These are not the things that are in my hand. Or I cannot decide to live, you know, for example, 1,200 years. I cannot fly. So we have some limited space for freedom. Okay? There are many things that I cannot decide. I cannot change, whether I like it or not. But what is important? This is very important. In that limited space, everything which I need for my happiness 
for my salvation can be decided. So I have enough power, enough freedom to make myself the happiest person of the world or the most wicked person of the world. Even if no one cooperates with me. Imagine everyone wants to stop me from being a good person. They cannot stop me. What can they do? They can beat me. They can torture me. They can imprison me. They can kill me. All of this will increase my iman. They can put Ibrahim into fire. But they cannot take away his iman. They can take away your life. But they cannot take away your iman. Iman is something that no one can take away from you unless you yourself give up. Sometimes I myself, you know, give up. That's another issue. I see, you know, some, you know, sceneries, some attractions in haram. Then I become weak. I give up. But if you want to remain strong and persistent, no one can force you to become kafir or bad person. So, we have enough and sufficient amount of freedom to define our destiny. What type of person you want to become, it's up to you. You cannot change many things, but you can change yourself from a good person to bad person or from a bad person to good person. And this is the most important thing for us. Everything else is not that much important. This is the most important thing. Now, we have a very important question about the role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially his qada and qadar. If we are free to do what we want, so what about his qada and qadar? We have to believe in his qada and qadar. Many times people say, you know, it was the qadha of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I have become what I have become. My children have come, become as good or bad, say it was qadha or qadar. I have bad marriage, say it was qadha and qadar. I lost my money, it's a qadha and qadar. So, what is the real meaning of qadha and qadar? Can, can we continue or should I have break? When did we start? Should, should we have break? Okay. I want to have a more detailed discussion about Qadha and Qadar. More than the book, we want to expand because this is a very important concept and unfortunately it's not well understood sometimes or many times. Let us first understand the literal meaning of qadha and qadar and then the technical meaning. In the Quran, qadha, yaqdi, qadha, and maqdi, these are different uh, derivatives of the same root, are used in different ways. Sometimes Quran uses qadha to refer to the final will or decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah verse 117 Badi'u as-samawati wal-ard wa idha qadha amran fa innama yaqulu lahu kun fa yakun Allah is the creator of the skies and the earth when he decides something he says be and there it is qadha what does it mean here means arada because we have this also in the Quran, إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْءً أَنْ يَغُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَقُونَ So, qadha sometimes means final decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, decisive decision. And there are many verses. Another example, I mentioned only a few examples, not all the examples, is in the case of Lady Maryam, salamu alayha. When the angel or the spirit informed the lady about having a son, a child, قالت رب 
انا یکون لی ولد ولم یمسسنی بشر My Lord, how can I have a child while no person has touched me? قَالَ كَذَلِكِ اللَّهُ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَا Allah creates what He wants in this way. إِذَا قَضَى أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُنْ When He decides to do something, He doesn't bother whether it's father or not. He says, be, there it is. Even if I can create without mother and father. So this is one meaning of qadha. Another meaning of qadha in the Quran is to legislate a law, to make a law. For example, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا Surah Isra, verse 23. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنَ إِحْسَانَ Your Lord has legislated. So here the meaning is that he has made this law, this obligation. You must not worship anyone other than him and you must be kind to your parents. You see how important it is to be kind to your parents. It comes right after Tawheed. قَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنَ إِحْسَانَ The third meaning of قَضَى in the Quran is to judge. Surah Nisa number 65. The verse that I recited yesterday. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتْ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا They are not believers unless when they have disputes, they ask you to arbitrate and when you judge. قَضَيْتَ means judge. So one meaning of قَضَى means to judge. We say قَضِي to judge. Yeah, today it is used. The fourth meaning of قَضَى is to finish. When you finish, in Arabic they say qadha. And when something is finished, they say en qadha. For example, when your passport is expiring, this expiry in Arabic called en qadha. فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمْ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهِ كَذِّكْرِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ أَوْ أَشَدَّ الذِّكْرَى This is for Hajj. Surah Baqarah, verse 200. إِذَا قَضَيْتُمْ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ means when you finish your rights, your amal. قَضَيْتُمْ means finished. Another example in Surah Nisa, verse 103. فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمُ الصَّلَاةِ فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِكُمْ When you finish salat, or in Surah Jumah, فَإِذَا غُدِيَتِ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ so one meaning of qadha means to finish. The fifth meaning of qadha is to destroy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the story of Prophet Musa, Surah Qasas 15. You know there was a fight between a follower of Musa and an enemy. Okay? وَدَّخَلَ الْمَدِينَةَ عَلَى حِينَ غَفْلَةٍ مِنْ أَحْلَهَا When people were sleeping or, you know, anyway, were heedless, he went to the town. فَوَجَدَ فِيهَا الرَّجُلَيْنِ يَقْتَتِلَانِ He found two people are fighting. هَذَا مَنْ شِعَتِهِ وَهَذَا مَنْ عَدُوِهِ One of them was his Shia, his follower, one was his enemy. Then the one who was his Shia asked for help. فَاسْتَغَاثَهُ الَّذِي مَنْ شِعَتِهِ عَلَى الَّذِي مَنْ عَدُوِهِ Prophet Musa punched him, he, he died. Maybe he had heart attack or whatever. His punch perhaps was not the reason. <laughs> anyway, he died. Then Prophet Musa, of course, regretted. Not that regretted what he did. Regretted why this person was, you know, uh, fighting. قَالَ هَذَا مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ عَدُوٌّ مُضِلٌّ مُبِينٌ Anyway, فَقَضَى عَلَيْهِ means finished him. 
or the people who are in hell, Surah Zukhruf 77, about the people of hell. I mentioned this ayah yesterday. وَنَادَ يَا مَالِكْ لِيَغْضَ عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكْ They say to Malik, Malik is the patron of hell. They say, your Lord should finish us, means destroy us. Said, قَالَ إِنَّكُمْ مَا كِثُوا No, you must, you must uh, stay here, you have to stay here. So, sometimes qadha means final will, decisive will. Sometimes qadha means to legislate. Sometimes qadha means to judge. Sometimes it's to finish. Sometimes it's to destroy. If you look at all these cases, there is something common. Qadha always refers to end. Ending something. Yeah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about our deadline, our ajal, says Surah An'am, verse 2. هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ طِينَ ثُمَّ قَضَى أَجَلًا Allah is the one who created you from clay, then He decided a deadline for you. Everyone has a deadline, ajal. But, وَأَجَلٌ مُسَمَّنْ عِنْدَهِ We have ajal musamma and we have ajal muallaq. There is a deadline which is decided, you cannot go beyond that. But there is conditional deadline. Many people die before their fixed deadline comes. Especially in Akhir zaman people die sooner than what they could have lived. There is no reason why we should die in the age of 30, 40, 50. Maybe we could have lived 500 years. Or maybe this person was supposed to live 60 years, but now he died sooner. In Akhir zaman unexpected deaths uh, go very high. People die sooner. So you have a fixed deadline that never can be extended. But there are suspending or conditional deadlines that can be extended. If you give sadaqah, if you do salaya rahim, if you are kind to your parents, your parents pray for you, then you can minimize the distance between ajale mu'allaq and ajale musamma. So you extend your life, not beyond ajale musamma, but ajale mu'allaq is extended. So, qadha ajalan, means he has made this ajal planned and fixed. So now we are reaching the technical meaning. What is the meaning of qadha? When we use qadha and qadar. Qadha means final situation which is planned. Final situation which is planned. What is decisive? What is going to happen? This is qadha. It must be final. It must be decisive. Okay? But, this doesn't mean that I have no role in it. Part of the factors that make this final plan is my own behavior. Inshallah, I will explain. Just keep it for the moment in your mind. I mention Qadar and then I come back to Qadar and Qadar. Qadar has been used in the Quran in different ways. Qadar literally means measure, means size. For example, in Surah Fussalat, verses 11 and 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ اثْتَوَى إِلَى السَّمَاءِ وَهِيَ الدُّخَانِ فَقَالَ لَهَا وَلِلْأَرْضِ اَتِيَا طَوْعًا أَوْ كَرْحًا 
Allah, when He wanted to create the world, there was a time that a sky and the earth were smoke. Okay? Then He told the sky and the earth, come, whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not. They say we come and we love to come, willingly come. قَالَتَ أَتَيْنَا طَائِئِنْ فَقَضَاهُنَّ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتِ فِي يَوْمَيْنَ In two days Allah made seven skies. وَأَوْهَا فِي كُلَّ سَمَاءٍ أَمْرَهَا And He revealed to every sky its affairs. وَزَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيهَا وَحِفْظَا The lowest sky is where we have all these stars. For decoration and for protection. Then he says, ذَلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمِ This is the planning of Allah who is Aziz. Aziz is the one who is powerful and is never defeated. Aziz doesn't mean dear. Here Aziz means the one who is not defeated. Al-Alim. He is not defeated because he has knowledge. So, Taqdeer, what does it mean here? Planning. He has planned everything with measure. Another case is in Surah Zukhruf verse 11. وَالَّذِي نَزَّلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً بِقَدَرٍ Allah is the one who sent down rain from the sky بِقَدَر with a measure. You know, when rain comes, it doesn't come just in bulk. Every drop of rain which is supposed to come is measured. It's not that, you know, they open the, you know, pipes and, you know, then after some time say, oh, now let's close it. Everything is in measure. Everything is planned. And if we had knowledge, we could have understood ourselves that how much rain is going to come. وَالَّذِي نَزَّلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً بِقَدَر According to measure. Another ayah is Surah Shura 27. وَلَوْ بَسَتَ اللَّهُ الرِّزْغَ لِعْبَادِهِ لَبَّغَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ If Allah had given plenty of sustenance to people, they would have become arrogant and tyrant, and they would do zul. وَلَكِنْ يُنَزِّلُ بِقَدَرٍ مَا يَشَاءٌ Therefore, He gives in measure. He doesn't give us, you know, too much. If we had too much, we became extravagant. بِقَدَر So He gives according to measure. Another ayah is وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لَمُسْتَقَرًّا لَهَا ذَلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمِ Surah Yunus 38 Planning And very general ayah are these two ayah Surah Qamar 49 إِنَّا كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقْنَاهُ بِقَدَرٍ Everything that we have created, we created in a very fixed measure Everything is created in measure. Another ayah which needs discussion, it's a very beautiful ayah, very deep. Surah Hujr number 21. Hujr 21. illa endana khaza'inuhu wa ma nunazzaluhu illa biqadarin ma'loom uh, Hedra, let me find for you the number. This ayah, Surah Hedra's Khaza'inhu, is a very philosophical discussion. Chapter 15, verse 21. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, everything that you see, you have, has its treasures with us. Treasures are there. 
in min shay'in illa indana khaza'inuhu. Some people compare this to the ideas of Plato, the ideas. Some people say it's different, and I think it's different, but it has similarities. Everything in this dunya has its treasures with Allah. وَمَا نُنَزِّلُهُ إِلَّا بِقَدَرٍ مَعْلُومٍ And we only send down a very fixed amount. If there is rezq here, if there is knowledge here, if there is wisdom here, anything good which is here, it's coming from those unlimited treasures. وَمَا نُنَزِّلُهُ إِلَّا بِقَدَرٍ مَعْلُومٍ So qadar means what? According to all these cases, qadar means planning or measure. Okay? Qadha has five meanings, but all has the concept of ending inside. Finishing, ending. So now, what is qadha and qadar? This needs a short break. And then, inshallah, we come to the conclusion. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفه اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين uh, I uh, know that uh, there are questions, and especially sisters have some questions that they didn't have chance. So, inshallah, when I finish this part, then we'll have some pause to listen to the question, inshallah. Uh, so, we said there are different senses in which qadha is used in the Quran, five meanings. And what is common in all of them is the concept of finishing or ending. And qadar is used normally for planning or measure. Of course, we have qudra, but qudra and qadar, although have the same uh, letters, but uh, they are somehow different. Now, the conclusion about the concept of qadha and qadar in the way that I understand it and may Allah, inshallah, help me to explain it in a clear way. We human beings have normally different options. For example, I can go to north, I can go to the east, to the west or south, four directions. This is geographical. But we have similar directions and choices in many areas. I can choose this subject when I go to university or that subject or another subject. I can go for this career or that career. I can marry this person or that person. I can go to, for example, visit my parents. I can go to visit my children. I can go to cinema. I can sleep. So there are many options. Each option that you take puts you in a kind of road, in a kind of passage, which would lead to a destination. And these destinations are different. If you take this direction, it takes you somewhere. If you take another direction, it takes you somewhere else. Those roads, ways, or passages that you can take, these are called qadar. And the destination that would be the end of this road is called qadha. So, it's totally up to you. To
to follow this qadar or that qadar and then at the end have this qadha or that qadha. When you go to a school and you don't study, you don't learn anything, so they will perhaps ask you to leave the school. And this is qadha. But you could have studied and they would have respected you and kept you in the school, then that would be qadha. And both of them are final. Both of them are decisive. Depending on the direction that you took, that is decisive, that is final. Everyone could predict that this is going to happen. It is not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided something for us and then he takes away my freedom and I blindly go to that direction and then I say, okay, it, it was ghaza, it was decided, I couldn't do anything. It's up to you. You go to travel. You don't check your petrol tank. You don't check your tires, brakes. You go and then the car is broken or, you know, you have to stop. Then say, it was ghaza of Allah that... I had to stop here. Maybe there is khair here for me. No, there is no khair here. You, you must have checked all these things. You were lazy or careless. If we act properly, we decide which one is the best one to take me to the ideals, to the aims that I have, and we trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should always go for success. There was no qaza or qadar of Allah forcing Muslims to remain backward or, you know, undeveloped. Muslims were the forerunners in civilization, in science, in everything. But then bad rulers, corrupt rulers, bad sometimes ulama, didn't let good people, you know, to do their things properly, so we ended up with being this situation. We cannot complain to Allah or we say, you know, this was qaza and qada. Everyone who works more, but with planning, with farsightedness, with consultation, then he can have success. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us freedom, has given us different options with guidance, either a specific guidance or general guidance like thinking, planning, consultation. And then we should try to find the best way. Qadha is not forcing anything. Once Amir al muminin was sitting next to a wall which was going to fall. When Imam saw the wall is not, you know, stable, left. Someone said, are you running away from Allah's decree? Imam said, I am running from qadar of Allah to qadha of Allah, or vice versa. Which means that if I am here, it will fall on me. If I go somewhere else, it doesn't fall on me. Nothing is fixed. Yes, Allah knows what is going to happen. But Allah knows what is going to happen after my decision. A person went to Imam Sadiq and said, is it Qadha of Allah that I eat this, for example, fruit? And his intention was to do something to defeat Imam. So his intention was, if Imam says Qadha is to eat, I don't eat. If he says it's not to eat, I eat. So he asked, what is the Qadha of Allah? What is the decree of Allah here? Is it the decree of Allah that I eat or don't eat? Imam said, if you eat, that is the decree of Allah. If you don't eat, that is the decree of Allah. It's up to you. If I eat lots of sugar and, you know, cookies and coke, and then I have diabetes, then I can say, this is qaza of Allah. But the qaza that I have planned for myself, the planning, the road that I have taken, comes to this conclusion. If I was careful, I could have avoided this. So, 
This is the meaning of qada and qada. There are certain things which are planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our freedom has no role in them. For example, the movement of the stars or planets, many things that happen in this dunya, whether we want it or not, whether we like it or not, they are happening. Everything is planned. For example, Shams Tajri la Mustaqarran laha. That has nothing to do with my decision. So for them, Qaza and Qadar are fixed. But for me, whether I am going to be a good person or bad person, happy life or not, this is dependent on my role. So some affairs are decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regardless of my choice. Some of them are decided according to my choice. But here there is a very delicate issue. And this is what I want you to listen carefully. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something to happen in our life, in human life. Then the question is, does he take away our freedom or not? For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted Musa to defeat Pharaoh. He had planned this. Does it mean that regardless of what Pharaoh was going to do, Allah was forcing this on Pharaoh and everyone? So he removed their freedom? Or no? He didn't remove the freedom. The answer is this. Are you alert? It's a very important point. Say salawat. Allah never takes away the freedom of people. But He knows how to plan so that you freely do what He wants. This is my understanding. He doesn't remove your freedom. But he is the one who plans in the way that you do what he wants. And you think that you are fighting his plan, but indeed you are part of his plan. Okay? Makaru wa makar Allah. They make plans. Allah makes plan. Wallah khayrul makari. Allah is the best planner. What does it mean? It doesn't mean that Allah, they make a plan, Allah makes a counter plan, and his plan is better. No. They make a plan, Allah says, okay, now I make a master plan that your plan becomes part of it. So you will be my agent then. You work for me. You work harder in order to make my plan faster. So, when Allah wanted Pharaoh to be destroyed, He didn't force anyone. His plan was that Musa should be able to defeat Pharaoh. But he was so capable of his plan that he informed Pharaoh about his plan. He didn't keep it secret. Pharaoh in his dream was informed that someone in Bani Israel is going to be born and is going to destroy him. If Pharaoh had not done anything and had or started asking for Tawbah, anything could have stopped. But Pharaoh thought he's very clever. So he started to make a plan to stop the plan of Allah. Then everything he did helped the plan of Allah. So what did he do? He started killing the sons of Bani Israel. And as a result, mother of Musa had no choice other than putting Musa 
in a gasket and putting him into a river. Then the plan was made such a nicely that exactly the river took him to that branch that was going near to the palace of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, who had no child, happened, we say chance, but it was not chance, who had no child, at that time was standing next to the river with his wife. Having no child, now seeing a baby is coming with gasket. And they love this baby. So now they said, let us look after this baby and take it as our son. Okay? So, Musa, who was supposed to be brought up in a normal house under the care of his mother, now is brought up in the palace of Pharaoh with all the training, a special training that someone who is son of Pharaoh can have. He has all the techniques, all the trainings. He knows the mentality of Pharaoh. He has all the respect. He has not lost his mother. His mother is also with him. But in addition, he has a lady like Lady Asia with him. If he was in his own house, he didn't have Lady Asia. You know, Lady Asia was higher than mother of Musa. So he has the care of Pharaoh, the education, training, mentality, everything, mother and Asia. So, Pharaoh wanted to stop Allah's plan, but then he served 100% Allah's plan. This is the meaning of makaru wa makar Allah. Allah didn't force Pharaoh. He was quite alert. Or for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted Musa to have some signs so that people can trust him that he's from God. Okay? But how could he have convinced people that I am sent by God? Pharaoh helped him. How? Pharaoh said to Musa that we should have an appointment. That we ask all people to come. And we bring our own magicians and you bring your magic in front of people and then we see who is right. Okay? Everything was suggested by Pharaoh. And Musa just accepted. So they asked the best magicians to come. Some say, you know, 72 people, you know, were selected. So, the best magicians came. And in a day which was perhaps a feast day that all people were there, in the beginning of the day, in Zoha, maybe about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, when everyone is fresh and alert, not like 4 p.m. So, <laughs> so, all the magicians were there, and in front of everybody, they saw that the stick of Musa swallow all those magics. And then the greatest magicians of the country all embraced the religion of Musa and they said to Pharaoh who promised that I'm going to crucify you, they said, no problem. We are going back to Allah. Nothing like this could have defeated Pharaoh. Such a, you know, propaganda machine that you bring all the magicians and then the magicians confess that Musa is right. Musa could never plan for this. Pharaoh planned for this. So this is the meaning of makaru wa makar Allah. Did Pharaoh lose his freedom? No, he didn't lose his freedom. He was acting freely. But Allah made the plan in the way that his freedom and his plans and his agents and his money, his power, everything served Allah's plan. This is why Allah says, يُرِيدُونَ لِيُطْفِئُوا نُورَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ مُتِمُّ نُورِهِ They want to blow 
and switch off, extinguish the fire that Allah has set up. But when they blow, what happens? More oxygen goes. <laughs> the fire becomes even stronger. So, truth, justice, Islam can never be defeated by enemies. It's impossible. The only thing is that friends can damage Islam. Friends, internal problems are always the most destructive. No one from outside can do anything against religion of Allah. But the people who are inside, they can do all the harm. You know, Allah says, اليوم يأس الذين كفروا من دينكم فلا تخشوهم وخشون. From today, don't fear any kafir. Fear me. It means that you may do something wrong that I take away the ni'mah from you. Okay. Now, another story is a story of Imam Zaman. Ajalallah ta'ala farajahu sharif. Allah has made decision that definitely this world would end with good end. And this is decided. Okay, what does it mean? Does it mean that people will lose their freedom? And Allah forces people that they should, you know, do something that Imam Zaman comes? No. If people were supposed to lose their freedom, Allah could have done this, you know, 100 years ago, 400 years ago. It's not going to happen by force. Allah has this plan. But he hasn't fixed which generation is going to be that generation. And he is patient. Finally, this is going to happen. We can bring it earlier or we can delay it. He doesn't force. He doesn't say, I am losing my patience. Now you must do something. No. He is patient and finally this is going to happen. But he wants us to do this freely. If we work properly, Imam Zaman can come tomorrow. I mean by tomorrow, I mean in a matter of few weeks. There is hadith that if only one day is remaining, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would extend that day and Imam Zaman would come. But if we are not doing properly, this can be delayed and delayed. So it can be a matter of few days or few weeks, it can be a matter of few thousands of years. And no one knows. And he is patient. He waits till a generation of human beings would be determined to do this. He doesn't force. He doesn't take away our freedom. Of course, if he wants our generation to be that generation, he knows how to do it in the way that he helps us. If we work hard and if we pray, he can help us. But he never forces this on us or on the enemies. Force has no place in his planning. The planning is always with freedom. So, one of the verses of the Quran that can confirm this idea is this verse. About one of the battles, I think it was the Battle of Badr. In Surah Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ أَنْتُمْ بِالْعُدْوَةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ بِالْعُدْوَةِ الْقُسْوَى وَالرَّكْبُ أَسْوَلَ مِنْكُمْ وَلَوْ تَوَاعَدْتُمْ لَاخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِي الْمِئَادِ وَلَكِنْ لِيَغْضِيَ اللَّهُ كَانَ أَمْرًا مَفْعُولًا Also, in the verse 44, 
Allah says wa id yurikumuhum id iltaqaytum fi a'yunikum a'yunikum qalilan wa yuqallilukum fi a'yunihim liyaghdiyallahu amran kana maf'ula If you refer to surah anfal 42 44 you see liyaghdiyallahu amran kana maf'ula what does it mean Allah had planned that this fight must happen So what did he do He made the number of the enemies look little in the eyes of muslims and the number of muslims little in the eyes of kuffar then they said okay this is a very easy pattern let's go and fight he didn't force them but he planned it in the way that they themselves decided to fight why liyaqdiyallahu amran kana maf'ula because this was supposed to happen or Allah says you were in a lower place they were in a far and higher place if you had made appointment and you would have seen that they have a better position they would say you would say no i won't want fight but Allah made it in the way that you decided to fight liyaghdiyallahu amran kana maf'ula so when he wants something to happen he plans in the way that you yourself decide to do it Okay? So there are many ways that also we can benefit for education of our children or students. You don't need to force them. But you can use factors and parameters that then they freely do what you want. Yeah? For example, by promising to buy for them something you can motivate them to do good things and you are not forcing you use a soft power yeah you say if you say your salat i am going to buy for you for example this chocolate so it's much better than you know say beat i'm beating you and if you don't you know say salat or you know take him by force and put him on sajada you know you must pray you can use techniques that he or she freely decides you know like for example one difference between some you know countries in the middle east or third world and in developed countries when it comes to politics in those countries which politics is very you know not sophisticated if they want someone to come into power they use military power or they make a coup to bring this person to power but in some countries they never do this they ask you to spend your money and bring someone that they want to power you do all the labor and pay money and everything but at the end what they want comes to power because they can plan everything in the way they know your psychology they know what you like what you don't like and based on that they make everything in the way that you go after their choice you feel you know it's my freedom and in a sense you are free yes you are free but this freedom is regulated and directed okay or for example you know if the companies want to sell the products they don't force you to buy but they use techniques so that you decide to buy what they want to sell yeah you cannot take them to the court and they have forced me no i didn't force you you say you know you put this billboard in front of my house every day my child is looking at this board and asking me to buy this they say we didn't force you our child you decided and in a legal sense yes they didn't force you but they planned it in the way that you purchase their product so these are the things that we can learn for good purposes to plan things in the way that people with freedom come towards moral values towards good practices towards religion 
okay, this is about Qaza and Qadar and the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us freedom to act and decide. So, yes. Yeah, they can they can plan so that you do bad actions. So you have to be careful. Allah never plans that we do bad actions. Yeah. No, unless if it is a matter of punishment. If it is a matter of punishment, then sometimes. You know, the Quran says, for example, there are people who have problems. For example, They have illness, then Allah increases their illness. How does Allah increase their illness? Not by injecting, you know, virus. Allah increases their illness by letting them continue. Okay? So, for example, if instead of choosing good friends, I choose bad friends, okay? Then what happens is that day by day, these bad friends add to my problems. You can say Allah has added to your problem, but in a sense, Allah has not added himself. This is the problem that you have started and it's now growing. Like... If fire is starting in one room and we don't extinguish fire, this fire is spreading and increasing. You can say Allah increased the fire, but not that Allah increased the fire in the sense that he wanted you to lose. In the sense that everything that happens in the world, as we said about Tawid Af Ali, can be attributed to God, but based on the regulations. Is it clear? Yeah, and, and when you embark also, sometimes he pushes you. Yeah, but you can, you can, you can even negate that. He pushed the wrong. The wrong did not, was not submissive. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is in Surah Maryam, towards the end of Surah Maryam, I'm not, I, I just paraphrase it, I'm not, I don't remember the ayah specifically. But those people who, be, who, who disbelieve in Allah, and they do, Allah just sends them shayateen. Yeah, so sometimes bad people come to you and they add to your problem. So instead of being in the circle of good people, if you get associated with bad people, they add to your problem. So this is not shayateen in the sense of jinn? This is no, shayateen can be ends. Yeah, it can be ends. It can be ends. Shayateen al-jinn, shayateen al-ends. Yeah. Sometimes, as I said, we have human Satan who are worse. No, but in this particular ayat, uh, I have to see the ayah, but uh, shayatin is general. For example, in shayatin la yuhuna ba'dhuhum ila ba'd. They communicate to each other. This can be human shayatin. This can be gen shayatin. Okay, is there any question about Qadar and Qadar? Yes. No, it is free will. No, no. It is your insistence on wrongdoing that is creating all the problem. No, he never manipulates. So the best thing is never dare of resisting against his will. Because, the, you know, the more you resist or the more you want to fight, the more vulnerable you become. So, this 
is the world which totally belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must be very, you know, foolish to think that we can stop his plans. We can never stop his plan. The best is just to accept. And if I am doing something wrong, to immediately do tawbah. If I think, okay, I do a little bit more wrong and then I sort out this problem, no, it becomes worse and worse. By continuing wrong action, we never can sort out the problems. Uh, you know, it's like uh, when you are, uh, you know, what is this called? Uh, there are some places that uh, there is uh, water and clay you go inside. But, we say, but luck. Yeah. Yes. So when you are, for example, one leg is inside, you have to be very careful because the more you, uh, you know, move, you go lower. You have to be very careful. So when we are stuck with problems because of our sins, we have to come out by Tawbah. Not by continuing and thinking, okay, uh, I was not very careful. This time I tell lies, but with more careful attitude. This time I make sure that when I tell lies, I remember. <laughs> or when I'm doing this mischief, you know, this, uh, I leave wrong record of mischief. No. The more clever you think you are, <laughs> then the worst can happen. Yeah, it, it can be general. It can be general. It can be general. But we sent in our son, Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, always bad people encourage doing bad actions. Many of these people who are in gangs, you know, members of gangs, if they were alone, they were not doing these things. When you are a gang member, you know, you get encouragement from other members. <coughs> yes. Um, what about the hadith that says, as you are, you are in doing this sabah. Yeah. So, what part of sabah is that referring to? Yeah. So, one of the discussions that I have here is about dua, after this discussion. So, it's good that you ask. So, dua is one of the factors that function and work. With dua, the overall balance can change. Without dua, we could have had shorter life. With dua, now we can have longer life. It's like, for example, I am taking this direction and then I take a break, I get energy and continue, or I take this direction and don't take break, then I have accident. Dua is so powerful that hadith says, يَرُدُّ الْقَضَاءَ الْمُبْرَمَ الَّذِي أُبْرَمَ إِبْرَامَ It means that without this dua, what was final and decisive was something, after dua can become something else. Or sadaq, paying charity, can change qaza. There was a lady that Prophet Isa said in the time of her night of her wedding, she is going to die. That lady didn't die. Then they realized that she had paid sadaqa. She didn't die, she was saved. There was a person who was in the time of Rasulullah going outside Medina or outside town and Rasulullah said he's going to die. After some time he came back. There was no problem. People were surprised. Rasulullah said open the, you know, this uh, uh, bag or whatever was on his back. 
He had gone to collect some wood. There was a, a snake. Rasulullah said, what did you do? He said, I paid sadaqah. So, indeed, this was planned by Allah so that people get a lesson. That if sadaqah was not paid, that person was supposed to be poisoned and die. Sadaqah has changed the situation. This is ajal mu'allaq. Yamhullah ma yasha wa yuthbit wa indahu ummul kitab. We have lohu mahfuz in lohu mahfuz everything is fixed. But we have lohu mahfuz spot which is changeable. For example it is written this person is going to die tomorrow. If you read that law, you think that he's going to die tomorrow. After a few minutes, it is changed. He has been given extension. Why? Because he has paid sadaqah. Okay? So, qadha and qadar are not contradicting our free will, our choice. But at the same time, we have to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Lord of the whole world. And even if people who are around you, they freely want to harm you, he can protect you. you know, the one benefit of this qaza qadar is this, that if you ask Allah for help, don't worry about what other people are doing. If he wants to protect you, he protects you in the way that they are free, but they cannot harm you. They put Ibrahim salam in fire, and fire was so strong that they couldn't go close. They threw him with manjalik, yeah, from distance. But Allah saved Ibrahim. Allah made it very nice, not freezing cold. Okay, it was not freezing cold. It was bard, was salam. It was nice. Cool. So Allah saved him despite that fire. So if we rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submit our affairs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trust him, then he is capable of helping us in all circumstances. Allah saved him and punishment came to the Al Fir'aun, to the family of Fir'aun. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't know why he was crying. I can't understand that because for me it seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is helping him lose Ibrahim and then Ibrahim is saying no to that. Amma ilayka fala. So he just he chose Ibrahim as his dependent upon yeah. Allah? For someone like Ibrahim, even Jibrahil is a stranger. For someone like Ibrahim, must be directly with Allah. For me, even the lowest angel comes, you know, I say, please help me. <laughs> but for Ibrahim, Allah doesn't expect Ibrahim to forget him and go to Jibrahim. Yes. He said, Allah knows my situation, I only ask him for help. And for sure, Jibrahim couldn't do it what, like Allah did. So people are in different levels, and this is why I said, you know, trust has different levels. The way that we trust, the way that prophets trust is very much different. And sometimes we are not in that level, and then we want to trust like them, then it creates problems. Yes. Yeah.
اذكرني عند ربك يا ات از سيد at least he himself rated you know it is said that he regretted why he said remember me with your lord yeah you know in our level is not a problem but in their level is a problem hasanatul abrar sayyatul muqarrabi someone in the level of yusuf is expected to act different from someone in our level yes yeah yeah bada is change in generation like nasr nasr is in legislation abrogation in legislation sometimes allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a law temporarily is not fixed but he doesn't say anything then after some time he brings the permanent law or the new law the same is with bada bada is that everyone thinks that this is going to happen but then allah brings another scenario for example in the time of imam sadiq alayhi salam many people thought that ismail is going to be the seventh imam okay but ismail died before imam sadiq alayhi salam in our hadith is this is referred to as bada of course we know that right from the beginning the plan was imam kazim alayhi salam but people according to the surface they were thinking that ismail is going to become the successor so bada means allah sometimes hides what is going to happen and people think something else is going to happen then allah discloses his plan bada means azhar means he discloses his plan yes it's not change in his decision it's change in what people think yes Okay, we can have a short break, and inshallah. You have a question, yes? I have a question about forgetfulness. Yeah. Forgetfulness, when you forget 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 when Okay. We have two types of forgetfulness. Sometimes you forget and it's not your choice. These are forgiven. Uh, one of the things that in Hadith Raf it is said that people are forgiven is when you forget, they forget. Allah don't, doesn't punish you for what you have forgotten. Yes, maybe later you have to do qaza or, you know, compensation. But sometimes we forget things because they are not important for us. If they were important, we would not have forgotten. You know? When you go to meet your boss, you never forget to say salam. But when you meet your wife or husband, you forget. Why? It shows that there is an element of uh, will here. You are not careful. You don't pay attention. Yeah? So it's not always a matter of choice, but sometimes it's a matter of choice. Sometimes it is because it's not important. But we cannot judge, you know, but uh, it is also happening. Sometimes, you know, husbands and wives have problems, you know. The wife said, you forgot my date of birth, so it means that I'm not important for you. You say, no, I, ha I forget many things. You may also forget many things. But then she says, why every year you are forgetting? You could have, you know, 
made a note of this, then you don't have any answer, you know. If every year you forget, <laughs> so this is a problem. Okay, maybe we can have a break and then shut up. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا عبد القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوه وأكرمني بنور الفه اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا رحمة الله عليه. One of the discussions in this unit is about theory of evolution. Uh, as you know, uh, some people think that because of theory of evolution, we must change our understanding about creation of human beings and we cannot accept the religious narration or account of human creation because according to this theory we are not created directly or immediately we are result of a proof process first very simple and basic things were created, then basic forms of life, then gradually they developed, became, you know, animals, then uh, uh, monkeys and apes, and then finally us. So this design and order that you said is in human uh, creation, it is not designed by God. It is based on evolution. Okay, you can read, there are a few pages in the book. I mentioned a very uh, brief discussion with some extra points. First of all, we should know that Darwin himself was not atheist. Darwin himself was a religious person. Yes, some religious people had problem with his idea because according to their scripture or their interpretation of their scripture the idea of evolution is not correct because according to the scripture God has created human beings directly He has created man in his image but Darwin himself was not atheist and there are many people who are religious and they may believe in the theory of evolution. Second, theory of evolution is not a 100% proved scientific theory. Still today, there are many people who don't accept theory of evolution and there are some evidence against this. And one of the important evidence against the theory of evolution is that According to Darwin, there was expectation that fossils will be found of those beings which are in between. Because if it is evolution, then you must have all the chains of evolution. But after so many years, still there are, nothing is found in between. There are jumps. So this is a problem. Another problem is that According to Darwin, we have gone through some genetic changes so that we have become, for example, human beings than those monkeys who have remained monkeys. But scientists show us that there are some monkeys that they have more genetic changes than us. In the book it is mentioned. They have had more ch genetic changes than us. In any case, it's not a 100% proved theory. And even if it is proved, 
the maximum that it can say is that it is possible to have human beings who are result of evolution. Okay? It's possible. Or it's possible to have, for example, animals who are result of evolution of lower level beings. But it cannot prove that it is impossible to have creatures which are directly created by God. Maybe in the case of human beings, we have two types of human beings. Some created directly, some are created through a process of evolution, evolutionary process. In Islam, we don't have any problem with the theory of evolution. Why? Because some of our hadith says that before this Adam, there were many Adams. So there could have been generations of human beings before us. Maybe them or some of them were results of evolution. And they finished. We are result of Allah's immediate or direct creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, Surah Sajda, verse 7 and 8. الَّذِي أَحْسَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَهُ He is the one who made everything that he has created in the best way. وَبَدَأَ خَلْقَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ تِينَ He started the creation of man from clay. ثُمَّ جَعَلَ نَسْلَهُ مِنْ سُلَالَةٍ مِنْ مَاءٍ مَهِينَ But then he made the progeny of that man who was created from clay from water. From mean water means from a sperm and zygote. So, بَدَأَ خَلْقَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ تِينَ The beginning was from clay, but it continued from a sperm and ovum and so on and so forth. Okay? Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, one of the verses which is very clear is this. إِنَّ مَثَلَ عِيسَى عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ آدَمْ خَلَقَهُ مِنْ تُرَابِ Some Christians used to argue, they said to Rasulullah that if Isa is not son of God, who is his father? Every child needs father and mother. Who is his father if he is not Allah? Then this ayah was revealed. The example of Isa is like example of Adam. Allah created him from clay. If Isa has no father, Adam had no father and no mother. And you don't say he is a son of God. Now, imagine if Adam was a result of evolution and Adam had a mother and father who were, for example, not human beings but an animal. This ayah was not correct. It was not a right answer. Because they could have said, okay, he had a father, but the father was an animal, for example. Do you get the point? The only way that this ayah can answer to their question is to say that Adam had no father and mother. خَلَقَهُ مِنْ تُرَابِ Created him from clay, from soil. So, according to the Qur'an, it seems there is no nas. It's not 100% explicitly said that Adam didn't have father and mother. But it seems that we can understand from the Qur'an that Adam was created directly from clay by Allah. And then his progeny continued. But before this Adam, we could have had other children of other Adams who could be a result of evolution. And even about the Qur'an, some of our ulama have said even Qur'an can be compatible with evolution. Ayatollah Mishkini, rahmatullahi, he has a book, Takamul Dar Qur'an, Evolution in the Qur'an. He argues that some of the verses of the Qur'an can be compatible with evolution. 
especially when Allah says, for example, in Allah astafa Adam, Allah chose Adam. So there must be some other people that Allah chose Adam from them. Of course, we can answer this. What there is a possibility because there is no nas, this zahir. This is al mana zahiri means this is something that you can understand unless there is a proof against it. So. The Qur'an is compatible with takamul, with evolution, but it's more likely that the Qur'an says this generation is created directly. But there can be previous generations. But after all, what is important is, <coughs> with the discussions we had about creation and about the relation between necessary being and contingent being, that even if you are created through evolution, it doesn't make any difference. Still, there must be God. Either God has created us directly or has created a process. It doesn't make difference. We cannot say because there has been evolution, so it means that they are created without any creator. Indeed, Ayatollah Mutahari says, if we accept the theory of evolution, the need for God is even more. Because God must have created such a sophisticated system that he switched the button and then this process started and then at the end we have human beings. It's very difficult. To plan everything in the way that the best product comes at the end. Because, you know, when you have uh, changes, the changes can go to wrong right direction. Why everything worked so well that the best always remained? Indeed, they became better and better and better and better. So it doesn't contradict the belief in God. It has nothing to do with the belief in God or even it can be an evidence for having a designer in the world. So, it is not 100% proved. There are some evidence against it. It has no uh, kind of contradiction with Islam. Indeed, some of our hadith suggest that there were other human beings before this line. And also, whether there was evolution or not, we need the one who gives being, existence to us. It doesn't make any difference. We are contingent. We cannot explain why we are here. There must be at the end an uncaused cause. Illatul ilal. The first one that he exists because of himself, but he has given existence to us. So theory of evolution has no kind of problem for us. Um, you're saying that um, with the theory of evolution we need God to turn out to be the best creatures that we are. Um, one argument that's used is the argument of survival of the fittest. So there could be lots of different um, evolutions, but only the best survive because they have the tools that they yeah. need to survive. So the question is, why there was always something that could have survived? Why we couldn't end it up with nothing? You can say once by chance, second time by chance. Why over millions of years, always there was something who could have been surviving and always improving? So, we don't have any kind of problem about the theory of evolution and it doesn't pose any threat to us. We are in a very relaxed situation about this theory. But if you like, there are some scientists who really question the theory of evolution. And there are some documentaries in English produced in US. I have one of them uh, that they question the idea of the evolution. Pardon? Uh, we have to search. I have it in my office in Rome. Maybe I can, inshallah, send you the details. But uh, someone brought for me from US. Another uh, part of this unit is about 
discrimination. We human beings are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we have the same origin, the same ancestors, and there must be no discrimination. Imam, Sad, uh, sorry, Imam Zainul Abidin in the book there is a hadith, was asked about what is racism, what is, for example, discrimination. Imam said, if a person looks at negative points of his own race or nation and prefers those bad points to the good points of other nations or other races, this is bad, this is racism or this is biasedness. If you love your nation, if you love your family, this is not a problem. If I say, I am a black person, I am a white person, I am a yellow person, I love my people, that's not a problem. I am English, I am Chinese, I am Japanese, I love my nation, my race, no problem. But if you prefer your nation or race to others to the extent that even if you have some negative points, you prefer to the positive points of others. This is a problem. In other words, if you cannot see good in others, and you cannot see bad in yourself, this is the problem. There are people that no matter how much bad they have done in the history, or are doing now, they always are happy with themselves, pleased with themselves. And they look at everyone else as an inferior, you know, type of being. This is bad. Allah has created us all as human beings and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِنَّ النَّاسْ مِنْ أَهْدِ آدَمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِنَا هَذَا People from the time of Adam alayhi salam up to now مثل أسنان المشت They are like teeth of comb you know, comb has teeth, they are the same. لا فضل للعربي على العجمي ولا للأحمر على الأسود إلا بالتقوى Who is Arab or Ajam? Ajam means non-Arab. Who is red or black? They don't have any privilege over each other. إلا بالتقوى Except with taqwa. So we don't have any place for racism. In Hajjatul Wada, the farewell Hajj, last Hajj of Rasulullah, he said, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna rabbakum wahid, wa inna abakum wahid. Your Lord is the same, your Father is the same, kullukum la adam wa adam min turab. You are all from Adam, and Adam was from clay. أَكْرَمُكُمْ إِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ In a society in which the Quraysh were very proud of themselves. You know, Arabs were proud, but particularly Quraysh. Quraysh were very proud because they had, you know, honor of coming from Ibrahim and they had, you know, control over Mecca and Masjid al-Haram. So, for some of them, it was very difficult to see people who are coming from other nations, like Salman Farsi, like Bilal Habashi. You know, Bilal was a servant, was a slave. Then, he became Muslim, and Rasulullah so much respected Bilal that they were very jealous. It is said that one of these people said to Rasulullah that the reason we don't come to you is because of Balal Habashi, Salman Farsi, and Suhaib Rumi. So you have international in a team. <laughs> Ethiopia from Africa, Persia, Iran, Asia, and Roman, European. 
We don't want this. But Rasulullah was not listening to them. Sometimes they used to say to Rasulullah, please give us one day and give them another day. So when we come to you, they are not there. When they come to you, we don't come there. Look at the mentality. They wanted to be Muslim, but keep their racism. Rasulullah was not allowing that. But nowadays people can do this because there is no Rasulullah. So people say, we do it in the name of Islam. When Rasulullah asked Bilal to recite Azan on the top of Kaaba, some people were very angry. One of the people said, you know, called Atab, he said, I am thankful to Allah that my father was not alive to see this day. And Haras ibn Hisham said, Hasn't Rasulullah found someone better than this black crow? So this was the way they were treating, you know, people from black origin. But Islam demolished all these things. Even Balal was not a very good reciter. He was not able to see, uh, you know, pronounce Shin properly. But Rasulullah chose him because of his piety. And he was not going to lead the Salat. To lead the Salat, you need to, um, someone who can recite properly. But for Azan, it's not a problem. So, Rasulullah fought against this type of racism and discrimination. Even a slavery which was there, and Islam could not stop a slavery all of a sudden, because, you know, many things in Islam happened gradually. Legislations came gradually. For example, from the first day, Salat was not legislated. Salat, Zakat, or for example, uh, usury gradually became forbidden. So, a slavery also was there, but Islam planned in the way that first asked people not to take slaves. There is no way to get slaves. There is only one case, and that is about Kofar Harbi in the very clearly defined way. Second, Islam said, for many sins, the only compensation or one of the best compensations is to free slaves. Or, if you want sawab, free slaves. So, much sooner than many other parts of the world, a slavery finished in the Muslim world. There was no slavery in the Muslim world. Another discussion in this unit is about having no discrimination against any age group. You cannot say young people are bad or old people are bad. If there is a person who is qualified and he is young, we can give him leadership. The story of Osama. Osama was the son of Zaid, and he was appointed by Rasulullah as a commander. And when Rasulullah was ill towards the end of his life, he asked people to join Osama and go outside Medina. It was a plan of Rasulullah that some people would be away from Medina. So he asked them to go outside Medina and join Osama. And he said, man an Osama. For some people this was difficult. This is a young man. Why we should join him and be under his command? Was this the first and the second caliph? Whatever. Then, when some people protested, Rasulullah said, it seems that for some of you, this is difficult and not bearable to follow the commander Osama. 
And Rasulullah said, this is not new. Even when his father was a commander, you used to object. By Allah, his father was qualified for this position and his son is also qualified. So Rasulullah was giving position to young people. But if they are qualified, you know, sometimes we want to promote the youths, but we give them position when they are not qualified. This is mistake. Especially when it comes to religious, you know, programs. We should encourage youths. But they say, okay, because we want to encourage youths, from tomorrow, youths run this mosque. They have no education, no experience. <laughs> they make mess. Religion of Allah is not something you know you try. Are you ready to give your business to your youth people? <laughs> you don't give to people unless they are qualified, they have experience. We cannot give mosque to the youths to run. Yes, we say we can have youth committee, youth activities to get experience, to get qualification. If you have qualifications, alhamdulillah, now you can come and take over. But just because you are young, we want to give to you, this is not good. We should not discriminate against youth, we should not discriminate against old people. Why old people must always be ne neglected? Sometimes old are neglected, sometimes youth are neglected, it's not good. Yes. Yes. In Islam. In the Islamic world finished. Yes. Yeah, so in the time one means 12 centuries ago. In the West, up to 20th century, slavery was there. No. No, no. Islam came and tried to maintain and restrict and then gradually finish it. So in a few centuries, Islam finished everything. No. No. Only, only if there is war with Kafir Harbi, means someone who is atheist, attacks Muslims, if then they are taken as captive, instead of killing them, you keep them as a slave. But then again, you are encouraged to free them. You know, this is very uh, a delicate issue. Some, sometimes when we say, for example, in Wuzu, we say, Allahumma bayyad wajhi, make my face white. Or la to sawwid wajhi, don't make my face black. This white and black of hereafter is not black and white in dunya. This means with light or without light. No problem. Imam alayhi salam showed him love, respect, uh, treated him like other martyrs. Pardon? Not, uh, not. Uh, he himself. Not because he was black, because he was a servant also. He was servant of uh, one of the martyrs. So he thought that he is not, you know, he himself was not feeling happy. Otherwise, Ahlul Bayt Musalam treated him the same. No, no, maybe, for example, sometimes because servants were not able to use perfume or, you know, wash uh, frequently. These are the uh, accidental things. What is important is the light and 
the brightness of face. You can be a black person in, in the dunya and worldly sense, but in akhirah have illuminating face. Or the same is about heart. We, you know, we have some hadiths about heart is white when you commit a sin it becomes one you know like a spot of black again this is not color it's light and darkness so we have to be careful uh, when we use black and white yes. can I just ask um, the certain eyes in the Quran talk about the, the slaves whom your right hand possesses Malakat yeah so we, what context is this? If slavery is abolished, so if slavery is abolished, which category are these people who the right hand? But, but at that time they were slaves. So is, would you say those eyes are refer are, are so, so nowadays they are not applicable. Ah, okay. We don't have any a slave today. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So age also is not. Uh, a factor that by which you know should decide another thing is gender in Islam men and women are both human beings you know in the West there were people even up to recent centuries they had the idea that women are not human beings or they are in second order they are not as you know men they had no right for possession to have property they had no right for voting even in Britain you know up to the 20th century they couldn't vote so you shouldn't think that the whole world was like today but 14 centuries ago, when Islam started, brought the regulations and laws about women that still we are very proud of them. Right from the beginning, Islam said, you cannot mistreat your daughters. They used to kill their daughters bury them alive. Islam very clearly condemned this. وَإِذَا الْمَوْعُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بَأَيَّذًا بَنْ قُتِلَتْ They will be asked why you are killed? What was your sin? Islam said having a daughter is ni'ma, uh, rahma from Allah, is a mercy from Allah. <coughs> Rasulullah treated his daughter with maximum respect. When Lady Fatima was going to see Rasulullah, Rasulullah was standing up. For the people of that time, this was not acceptable. You know, don't look at today. Today, sometimes people in front of public, they show respect to women, you know, or children, or youths, because this is now a day to gain popularity. In that time, this was making someone lose his popularity. If they see a man is standing in front of his daughter, this was a very bad thing. When Rasulullah was kissing his grandchildren, a man said, I never kissed my children. It was you know, a sign of weakness. A man must not kiss his children. You should not say, I love you to your children or to your wife. A man never says such things. Because they thought this is bad, you know, you are a weak personality if you say, if you show emotion. You should not show any emotion. But Rasulullah was respecting his daughter a lot. Whenever he was leaving Medina, Lady Fatima was the last person to say salam. When he was returning, she was the first. Said, she is the mother of her father. Okay? Or... When it comes to ownership, Allah said, لِلْرَجَعَلِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا اَكْتَسَبُوا وَلِلْنِسَائِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا اَكْتَسَبُوا Women can own, men can own. For marriage, Islam said, no one can force his daughter to marry. The consent of the girl is needed. 
When it comes to mothers, Islam gave lots of credit to mothers. Indeed, if your mother calls you and your father calls you, according to some hadith, you have to first respond to your mother. Yes? Respond to your mother, say, Mommy, please wait, I'm going to listen to father. <laughs> I'm joking. So, mothers must first be attended. Or, you know, hadith says, if you go back, first take gift for your daughter. Give your daughter the gift, then sooner, then to your sons. You have heard this story of someone asked Rasulullah that I have a you know, kind of problem, what should I do? Rasulullah said, be kind to your mother. Then he thought maybe this is not enough. He asked again, Rasulullah again said, your mother. Then again, mother. Then said father. Or someone had not a mother, said, go to the sister of your mother. Try to please her, yes. No, this is not discrimination against men. Of course, nowadays uh, discrimination against men is a starting, but <laughs> Islam wanted to bring balance. Because in that society, women were very marginalized. Mothers were, were like servants for father and husband. You know, even in India, when someone was dying, they used to bury his wife next to him. Maybe, I, I don't know. And burn on you. Father? Yes. So, this was the concept, that wife is nothing. So, Islam says, no, lots of respect for mother. Al-jannatu tahta aqdam al-ummahat. It's very powerful. Heaven is under the feet of mothers, not fathers. What does it mean heaven is under the feet of mothers? It means that if you want to go to heaven, you have to be humble. You have to please your mother. The way for heaven for you is by pleasing and being humble in front of your mother. Of course, this doesn't mean that your mother is in heaven. Your mother also for way her to go to heaven is to be kind to her mother. So every generation, the path to heaven for them is their parents. Do you understand? No matter whether my mother is good or bad, Muslim or kafir, I have to be very kind to my mother. Then, she has to be also the same with her mother. Of course, fathers have to be loved, have to be respected. But mothers have very special position. And if someone wants to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and wants one of the secrets of success is to be kind to your parents. Especially you have to be very careful because mothers are, you know, so emotional and they have worked very much for you. So little things can disturb them and, you know, make them upset and then you would suffer. So, the attention paid to women in Islam is a lot. There is a beautiful hadith in Uddat al-Da'i. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to this hadith, never gets angry like when he gets angry for a woman or a child being mistreated. When women are mistreated or children, Allah gets angry the most. Because these are vulnerable. These are like, you know, flowers. You have to be looked after in them. Men also should not be mistreated. But a man is able to defend himself somehow. But a woman or 
a child are more vulnerable. So Allah gets very angry if someone annoys her sister or her wife or her daughter. But when it comes to the rulings, in Sharia we have some rulings which are general. Maybe 90% of the rulings are general. Rulings about prayer, fasting, hajj, zakat, homes, amr ma'aruf. More than 90% are the same. Maybe only 1-2% are different. For example, when it comes to inheritance, there is a difference. If someone dies, the inheritance of son is twice the daughter. This is one of the exceptional differences. But again here, this is not a sign of discrimination. This is a ruling based on the society's needs. Because this son who is getting double, for example, this son is getting 20,000 pounds, the daughter is getting 10,000 pounds. <laughs> this son has wife and children, and he has to pay to wife and children. So 20,000 pounds is divided into four, five, six. But that girl, even if she has a husband or children, she is not responsible, she saves. She doesn't need to spend on herself even. So it's for one person, that's for one family. And also normally, sons are involved in the business of the father. They have been helping the father. If father has something, the sons have been also working. There can be exceptions, but when you make laws, you cannot you know, make laws according to exceptions. You consider majority. You know, for example, we say, Maximum speed is 70 miles. A person says, why 70 miles? I am a champion in the car racing. I can drive, you know, safely 100 miles. Say, so, sorry, exceptions cannot be accepted. We make the law according to the majority of cases. Maybe there was a case that this woman was helping her father more. But we have to consider general case. Or maybe uh, there's a person who has a son who has no family and children and this woman has some orphans. These are exceptions. Of course, Islamic is very good that everyone gives to the sister if they have more need. Or the father can make will that one third is given to my grandchildren. That's not a problem. But generally speaking, we have to have some general guidelines. Or about blood money. about a year. Again, here, if a person who has been killed is a man or woman, if a person has killed a man will be given twice. He, he will be asked to give twice. But no one thinks that we are giving twice to whom? We are giving two wives to his wife and children. If a woman is killed, we are giving half to his husband, her husband. So a woman is receiving double, not a man. You know, people don't take the message correctly. So there are rules like this and all are for the interest of the entire community and society, especially for women and children. Or sometimes people ask why certain positions in Islam are only for men. For example, why a woman cannot become marja? According to majority of ulama, they cannot be marja. Or according to majority, they cannot be judge. <coughs> so they say, why? This is discrimination. The answer is that First, you have to understand Islamic concept of position. Then you can say whether it is discrimination or not. In Islam, to occupy these positions is not a privilege, it's a responsibility. No one should think that it's 
a privilege to become marja or I don't know judge or president Islamically this is wrong if you ask me what is your dream in your life I say my dream is to become a marja I say sorry it means you are a very you know uh, bad person because you have this desire for a position Allah should make you marja not that you yourself say I want to become a marja you have to be very hesitant you have to run away only when there is need and no one else is there who is qualified you accept you say okay there is no choice now I have to accept not that you know I say please pray I become a marja you know or you help me and I become marja you know, work for me and you know, we should have a camp <laughs> you know no campaign the same is to be judged you know I am a man and I can become a judge but if you give me hundreds of thousands of pounds every month I don't become judge you can try I don't accept why because it's such a big responsibility if you are a judge you are between hell and heaven all the time the late Sheikh Ansari used to say to his students you must teach even if you are not sure it is for the sake of Allah or not so someone said you know teach me this Arabic or Aqaid even if you are not sure it's for the sake of Allah teach because at least those people learn if your niya is not good you don't gain anything but at least those people learn Become Imamul Jama'a if your intention is good. So teach even if you are not sure about intention. Lead the Salat if you are sure about intention. Never become judge even if you are sure about your intention is good. It's a big responsibility. So now when we say women are exempted from being judged, they should not feel that this is discrimination like for example when you say women are exempted from going to war this is ex exemption so if we look at it from Islamic perspective these are not signs of betterness or you know perfection Lady Fatima Salamullah Lady Zainab Salamullah they were better than 99% of men okay but they never became judge they never became leaders yeah it doesn't mean that you know sometimes we can have for example a marja and there is a lady maybe wife of that marja maybe daughter of that marja or maybe someone else is following that marja and maybe she is closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we don't say because you cannot become marja you are lower in the rank this is a responsibility this is a kind of obligation as long as there are men who are qualified other people should thank Allah subhanahu wa alhamdulillah this responsibility is not on me would you say it's as if women are protected by these exemptions or so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the view of majority of ulama who say this Allah indeed has done a favor that has not put this stressful position on them it's very stressful So we don't want women to receive bribery. <laughs> Allah in the, in the in the 60s when Reza Shah brought in his white revolution our ulama were against a lot of points a lot of the a lot of the street protests and one of the main protests the main points of was giving vote, voting rights to women 
But at that time, I'm Puluma in the 60s of old. Well, that was not a real uh, vote or democracy. They wanted to promote their Western uh, style of, you know, hijab and bringing women without hijab to the offices. So when society is not safe, you know, for example, sometimes ulama were not encouraging ladies to go to university because at that time universities were not good and safe. But after revolution, not only they didn't stop, they encouraged. Now we have more women going to universities than men. So it depends on the situation. It doesn't mean that they don't like education for women. We have to calculate the negative and positive sides. It was a, it was a, it was a political decision, not a religious. Yeah. yeah. It was a political, but based on, of course, some religious worries. Yeah. For example, you know, there was a time Reza Shah was asking for having presidential system in Iran instead of having king towards the end of Qajarid, you know, period. And some ulama stopped this and protested this. Not because, you know, in Islam, you know, we should have king and not, and not president. Because they knew that this is the plan of Reza Shah before he became, to destroy that dynasty of Qajaris who were more religious and bring his own system. So some people think that ulama were in favor of the king. No, they were not in favor of the king. They were worried that something worse can happen. No, only in one case. And in that case also, still it's better to release them. So... No, no, that is not, a, that was not, that was not Islamic. In the main Islamic land, it was finished. If you go to Iraq, to go to Iran, to Hijaz, there was no slavery in the recent centuries. So, some of these rulings are for general interest of the society and women themselves, but for us to understand them, we should understand what is the Islamic attitude towards position. Position has no value. No one should think that if I am president or minister or prime minister or judge or, you know, uh, uh, chief judge, this is a privilege for me. I am a better person. In Islam, the most important thing is, as we said, taqwa. And everyone can be muttaqi. Knowledge. Everyone can have knowledge. Alhamdulillah, we have always had in the, especially a school of Ahlul Bayt, we have had very educated women. We have had many ulamas who were women. Even, you know, we have in the time of Imam Sadiq, sometimes ladies ask Imam Sadiq, Imam was referring them to her, his wife. Now we have thousands of, tens of thousands of ladies who study in Hose, in Qom, and many places. And they are educated. They can become mujtahid. For themselves, they can be independent. But to take the position of leadership and marja'iyya, it's difficult for them. Something that sometimes happens in some societies is that they put lots of pressure on women but then they call it freedom. For example, in our society or culture or Islamic understanding, my wife is not responsible for any financial aspect of the life. Yeah? My wife doesn't need to bring even a penny and doesn't need to do anything in home. She doesn't need to cook, she doesn't need to wash, she doesn't need even to feed the children. Okay? 
Now we say women are oppressed in Islam. If someone is oppressed, it's men that are oppressed, not women. Because your wife is like a you know, flower, mar'atu reyhana. Just like a flower, you have to look after this flower. But in other cultures, they say, I bring 50%, you have to bring 50%. I pay half of the bills, you have to pay half of the bills. Sometimes they ask them to do difficult jobs. You know, they have to do all difficult jobs, and I'm very happy. You know, sometimes I see women doing jobs which are very even difficult for men, exhausting. But they feel, you know, happy. So this mentality is very important. You can have very happy life and you feel deprived, and you can be very deprived and you feel happy. This is the propaganda. You know? Sometimes we have the best food at home, you say, I want to go to a restaurant. Maybe the restaurant, the food is rubbish. <laughs> but everyone is going to a restaurant, I want to eat. In. You have the best thing at home, you have the best wife at home, then you look in the movies. I want that lady. So it's propaganda. We have to be careful. We don't lo shouldn't lose our own culture and beauties of our own, you know, civilization, just because other people are doing other things. The best system is the Islamic system. Of course, we Muslims not practice Islam all the time. You know, many times we don't practice Islam. But if we really practice Islam, like Ahlul Bayt salam, no woman ever wants to be a man. Do you think Lady Fatima ever said, if I was a man, I had a better position? I wish I was a man. Or Lady Zainab ever said, you know, if I was instead of Imam Hassan or Imam Hussain, I had a better position because I cannot become Imam. This was not the mentality. She was daughter of Amirul Mu'mineen, but when she was going to the shrine of Rasulullah, Amirul Mu'mineen was escorting her. Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein and Hazrat Abbas escorting her. Imagine three Imams and Hazrat Abbas are escorting this lady. This is the honor of a woman. We have shrines of ladies. We have shrine of Lady Masuma. All maraj go and you know the honor is that we want to visit this lady. No one says, you know, I am a marja, I am an old man, why I should visit this young girl? This is not our mentality. So we should be careful not to be affected by some of the ideas which come from the people who have long history of ignoring women and treating them like uh, not human beings. Okay, this is, uh, I think, most of the things that we needed to say about Unit uh, 3. And inshallah, we move on to Unit 4 after a short break. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَ أَنَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِ لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفح اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك رحمتك يا الله Now we are starting unit 4 This unit is about prophethood in general Next unit is the, the Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Normally, in the books of Aqaid or Kalam, we have an nubuvatul khasa and an nubuvatul amma, general prophethood, and then a specific prophethood about a particular prophet. One discussion in this unit is that Allah subhanahu wa taala who has created this world with purpose has guided everything towards the end or the purpose that it has. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْنَ السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا بَاطِلًا We have not created this sky and the earth and what is between them in vain, without purpose. ذَلِكَ ذَنُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا This is the way that those who don't have faith, they think. They think everything is created in vain, without reason, without purpose. So he has created everything with purpose. Therefore, he provides his creatures with two types of guidance. One is general. Everything has some kind of guidance. When Pharaoh asked Musa and Harun, وَمَنْ رَبُّكُمَا يَا مُوسَى Who is your Lord? They said, رَبُّنَا الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى he has created everything and he has guided. In Surah A'la we say, الَّذِي خَلَقَ فَسَوَّى وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَحَدَى So he has created everything and given guidance. In the form of either natural laws and regulations or in the form of instincts when it comes to animals, we have more than physics. We have instincts. When it comes to human beings, we have even more, in addition to what exists in the animals and lower levels. We have aql, intellect, and we have revelation. Allah has given us intellect and revelation. But still, we have instincts. But we have agl and revelation. Revelation. Wahy. In us, sometimes our instincts have become weaker than animals. Because animals, they don't have anything else. So their instincts are more. For example, we human beings, by instinct, we don't know how to make a house. Yeah? Because Allah has given us agl to use and find out. Or for example, by instinct, we don't know how to understand what is good food or bad food. A horse, a dog, a cat, they understand what is good for them, what is bad for them. But if you let a human child, they will you know, eat something poisonous and they will die. You know, one of uh, the scholars was saying something nice. He said, you know, you perhaps have never heard any animal falling from the edge of a building or, you know, a cliff. But if you leave a human child on top of a roof, goes and comes down and gets killed. Because our instincts are less than them. We are supplemented with aql and wahy. For them, everything depends on the instinct. The reason why we need both aql and wahy is because aql by itself is not sufficient. Aql helps us to reach revelation. Then, with the help of revelation, we have everything that we need. We cannot say we don't need aql, because without aql, how can you come to religion? How can you understand which religion is good, which religion is true? How do you understand religion? Inshallah, I will explain the functions of aql. We need certainly aql, but we need also revelation. Human reason is not enough. You see, the people who are deprived from revelation, they don't follow any prophet, any religion. Even in the most basic things, they disagree. And they have lost many values. Imagine if today we didn't have teachings of Musa, Isa, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Prophet Ibrahim, what would be the situation of people? With having all these, still we have so many problems. If we didn't have those prophets and we were only relying on our own reason, we had lots of problems, more problems. Uh, one of our great ulama has a beautiful point about 
which example we can use to understand the role of relig uh, reason in religion? If someone asks you, how do you explain the role of aql in religion? He says, there are three types of examples, but only one of them is acceptable. Sometimes people think that aql is like a key. We use the key to open the door and enter into religion. The key for opening the door is aql. Okay, this is good because we use aql to come to religion. But the problem with this example is that when you open the door, you don't need the key. So this means that we use aql to come to religion, then we close our aql, then what happens? Inside religion, you do all the bad things and you say this is religion, all the nonsense, all the irrational things. No, this is not the perfect example. Another example is aql is like a scale by which you measure and weigh everything. Everything which is said, you measure with aql. Again, this is not good. Because there are many things in religion which are beyond the power of aql. How can you measure if someone says, you know, you have to say two rak'a prayer in the morning? Okay, you put it in this measure, what do you understand? Say it has to be two and a half or three or four or one. Or someone says, you know, in heaven this happens, in, on the day of judgment this happens. How can you understand with aql? If you say, I don't understand anything except when it is measured by aql, so there are things that you cannot measure by aql. Not because they are against aql. Please pay attention. We don't have anything against aql in Islam. We don't have anything which contradicts the rulings of aql. But we have things which are beyond aql. It means aql is silent. Aql doesn't contradict. For example, if someone says that God is one and three, this contradicts aql. This is not possible. How can God be one and three? Uh, we have a discussion sometimes with our Christian friends and with all the respect, you know, we discuss, and they themselves say this is a mystery. At the end, you know, when we, uh, we reach this point always, that they say it's a mystery. We ourselves don't know why God is one and three. But this is said to us. Even some people said, you know, we believe because it's unbelievable. Okay? So, we don't have such thing in Islam that we say something against reason and we say this is misery. Uh, uh, sorry, a mystery. But we have things which are not available to aql. And this is very common. Even in human normal life, we have many things which you cannot find by aql. I ask you, what is the taste of a strawberry? Can you use your aql to say what is the taste of a strawberry? You have to taste it. <laughs> I ask you, how many people are in the basement? Can you use your aql to say how many people are there? No. This is not available to aql. Aql has no access. How many gates are for heaven? Aql cannot say anything here. Yes, if I tell you how many people are in the basement, and you say, I don't know, then I say there are one million people. You say, no, this is against aql because one million people cannot be put into this room but whether it is one or two or five or zero aql is silent so there is a limit that you cannot say anything contradicting aql but there can be many many things that aql is silent and we need the guidance of revelation so if you say we use aql as a measure by which we measure everything, or as a scale by which we a everything, and if it's not fitting into aql, we don't accept, this is wrong. 
Because there are many things that you don't understand by aql. It's not against aql, but it's more than aql. So what is the best example? Key was not perfect example. A scale or measure is not perfect example. The best example is light. You need light to find your way to the room. And even when you are inside the room, you need light. So, aql is a light that Allah has given us to come to religion and then understand also religion with the help of this light. In the school of Ahlul Bayt, we say aql is one of our sources. Kitab and sunnah and aql. Of course, ijma goes back to sunnah for us. So, it means that I need aql for becoming a Muslim. I also need aql to remaining a Muslim, to understanding Islam. If I say I am a Muslim, I don't need aql. So you are not a Muslim. You can be in anything. If someone closes his aql and reads the Quran and Hadith, then may come up with very funny interpretations. We have to have aql all the time. Our Hadith says inna lillah ta'ala ala nas hujjatain hujjatan zahira wa hiya al anbiya wa al rusul wa hujjatan batina wa hiya al aql allah has two types of hujja for us two types of proofs two types of communicating his will to us one is external in the form of prophets and messengers one is internal in the form of aql aql is a hujja how much you have to love aql? You have to love aql a lot because the hujja of Allah, hujjatullah. If it was possible to take prophets inside you, then it would become aql. If I was, it was possible to take Prophet Muhammad inside me, then it was my aql. If it was possible to bring aql outside, then it was prophet. So Prophet is embodied Aql. And Aql is internalized Prophet. Aql never betrays, never misguides. Because it's Hujjah of Allah. The problem is that sometimes we have, you know, some guessing, some opinions. We think this is Aql. And this is not Aql. Aql means something which can be logically proved and be shared with, with other rational people. If I say my aql is saying this, but I don't know why, I cannot tell you why. This is not aql. Aql is something that can be presented to all rational people. I say this is my argument. Then rational people can look into it, and they say, yes, your argument is correct. This is aql. If something can be proved rationally, this is hujjah. Uh, there is a beautiful hadith of Imam Kazim alayhi salam about aql. Uh, in beginning of Usul al-Kafi, Kitab al-Aql wal jah Imam says to Hisham ibn Hakam about the significance of aql. If you like, uh, the lectures are available online. Imam Kazim on the intellect. Uh, Eleven lectures, alhamdulillah, we had in Haram. Lady Ma'asuma. So much Imam emphasizes on aql. To the extent that Imam Kazim says, the highest people in Iman are those who are greater in their rationality. The highest people in Iman, the best mu'minin, are those who are better in their rationality. They are more rational. But rationality which comes with methodology, with knowledge. Sometimes people say, you know, why we don't think ourselves, we discuss things. And they don't have methodology. They don't know what scholars use. They bring religious issues to the public, to the lay people, and they think this is rationality. If you are a scientist, you know that to be rational means you have to have very clear methodology which can be proved and examined by the philo scientists. You know, I say I am a scientist, but I bring my discussion to the market. 
and I want to discuss with the people on the market because I am a very humble person. No, sorry. It means that you have problem with your argument. You cannot convince scientists, so you are going to deceive normal people. Why you cannot convince ulama? Then you find a few youths, you want to confuse them. If someone has a rational argument, he must say, this is my methodology. Get it verified by the society or, I don't know, institution of the scientists and say, please comment on this. No problem. Whether they all accept or some of them accept, at least they say that you have followed proper methodology. You don't agree with you, but yes, this is a scientific discussion. But I say, you know, I have a mathematical view, but then I bring a dream to support my idea. It's not methodology. I say, look, you know, everyone in the West is saying this, so Islam must also say the same thing. This is not methodology. If you are saying something about fiqh, you have to bring hadith, you have to bring ilm al-rajal, usul, and prove that this is what Imam is saying. To say that how can in 21st century, you know, we say a girl becomes baller in nine years. This is not methodology. This is playing with the emotions of people. If you have methodology, okay, bring the hadith and say this hadith is weak, this hadith is strong, this is the text of hadith. According to the rules of linguistic, this cannot be understood this way. Okay, that's understandable. But we cannot just play with the words. Maybe here no one is to stop me, but I should be fair. If I have any view, I should present it to the scholars. Anyway, aql is the hujjah of Allah if it is properly followed. If we have proper methodology, aql never betrays. It's impossible that aql misguides us. Quran says the people who are in hell, they say, لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلْ مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابَ السَّعِيرَ If we were listening, listening to whom? To the prophets, revelation. Or we were thinking, نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلْ If we were listening to the prophets, or using our angle, we would not have come to hell. مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابَ السَّعِيرَ so, they didn't follow aql, they didn't follow prophets, now the result is that they are in hell. Aql is always infallible, but you have to be careful. Don't listen to someone else like aql. Sometimes what happens is that, unfortunately, aql is imprisoned. Sometimes our nafs ammare takes control and imprisons aql. <coughs> Instead of aql being the commander, the nafs ammare takes the control. We say in uh, dua sabah, we say that aql maglub wa hawa'i ghalib. My aql is defeated, like two army, two armies. Army of aql, you have, you know, Junood al-Aql and Junood al-Jahl. Junood al-Jahl, the army of the ignorance, sometimes they defeat the army of aql. They put aql in prison or sometimes they kill aql. Then they take control. Nafsi ma'yub, qalbi mahjub, aql-i maghlub, wa hawa'i ghalib. So it means that this is a very uh, bad situation. Aql must be in charge. If Aql is in charge of my affairs, my family, my community, everything is according to Aql and wisdom, we don't have any problem. Because Aql and religion are the same. كُلَّمَا حَكَمَ بِهِ الْآغْلِ حَكَمَ بِهِ الشَّارَةِ وَكُلَّمَا حَكَمَ بِهِ الشَّارَةِ حَكَمَ بِهِ الْآغْلِ Whatever judgment is made by aql is made by religion. Whatever judgment is made by religion is made by aql. But proper aql, not personal opinion. Proper aql, something that a philosopher 
A scholar verifies. You know where you have started, which methodology you have followed, and make it available to the people to judge about it. Not something that you feel afraid to say to people. So, aql is a hujja of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. Their functions of aql are as follows. First, it is aql that asks me to inquire about religion. Why I should bother thinking about religion? You know, sometimes people think that it's better not to know anything. It's better not to do any research, not to attend any course. Because if you know, then you become responsible. Yeah? Why you are going to majlis or masjid or reading? You become more responsible. <coughs> Aql says, not to know is not an excuse. You think by not learning you have excuse? Do you think on the day of judgment you can say to Allah, I didn't practice because I didn't learn? Indeed you have two problems. Hadith says that some people are asked on the day of judgment, Allah amilt, why you didn't practice? He says, I don't know, I didn't know. Then Allah says, Allah ta'allamt, so why didn't learn? Why you didn't fast? I didn't know. Why didn't learn? So it's not a good excuse to say that I didn't know. By not knowing, Aql says you are not solving the problem. <laughs> if for example, they tell us, keep your radio or TV on because we are worried that there might be air strike, enemies may come and bombard us. Keep your radio on. Then I say, no, let me switch it off. I don't want to listen. Okay, is this a stopping enemy? So I say, because you have switched off, <laughs> you don't have any problem. Only those whose radio is switched on, they have to go to shelter. This is not an excuse. Amir al Mumin alayhi salam says, Man nama lam yunam an. If you sleep, your enemy doesn't sleep. Shaitan doesn't sleep. Jahannam doesn't sleep. All the problems don't stop. You know, there is a bird. I always mention this bird. When hunters go after this bird in winter, you know, when there is a snow, they go after this bird, and this bird cannot get rid of them puts its head in the snow and the leg in the air so that cannot see the enemy <laughs> so if you don't see the enemy the enemy can see you so Agl tells me that when there are religions different schools of thought different people who claim that they have truth you cannot say I don't bother you have to do research you have to study. Otherwise, the worries are there. The risks are there. Second, now that I want to do research, I say, okay, I am a serious person. I don't want, you know, to take any risk. What religions are available? Then they give me few religions few schools of thought, few schools of philosophy. How am I going to examine them? I cannot say I follow this religion because this is the religion of my father. Or I don't follow this religion because I have problem with my father. I want to change my religion. You have to use your aql to study and examine which religion is convincing. So it is with the help of Aql that we can examine, for example, Quran, the miracles of the prophets, to see whether they are convincing, we can understand that they are from God or not. So this is the second role of Aql. Then after you find which religion is true, how do you understand that religion? Again, you have to use Aql. So you need aql all the time. There is no time that you can say, I have used my aql enough. Then I want to park my aql in a car park. Aql is always to be used. But 
There are many ways that we can benefit from revelation, from wahy. For the things that we don't know by ourselves, wahy teaches us. يُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ the Prophet tells us some of the things that if we have been thinking and learning till end of our life, we couldn't understood, understand. Yeah? There are many things that we have learned from Islam that we couldn't know ourselves. But also there are things that we could have understood, but religion confirms. If religion was not there, maybe we were not sure whether we have understood it properly or not. Maybe we would have disagreed. Religion comes and confirms those things. So either teaches new things or confirms the things that we were able to know. And third, religion gives us encouragement, sanctions. You know, imagine if we all knew that telling lies is morally bad, but there is no punishment for that. A stealing is bad, but no punishment for that. Just it is bad because by Aql we know it is bad. Then there was a chance that we might have done many of these bad things when there was an interest inside or you know, it was easier. Now that Allah says if you do this, there is fire, still sometimes we do it. Imagine if Allah was not saying that there is fire and just you know, says follow your conscience. This would be then very difficult. You know, in the months of Ramadan, you know that if you don't fast, then you have to fast 61 days. So you never, you know, <laughs> play with this. Even if you are, you know, hungry and thirsty. So this is a blessing of Allah. If this 61 days was not there, many of people say, okay, I don't fast tomorrow, I, you know, after months of Ramadan, I fast again. Sometimes these punishments which are promised or rewards which are promised give us determination. If you do this, you do this haram, you deserve to go to hell. Then you try to be strong. Yes. Yeah, first of all, we should see whether they are both doing what they know is good or not. You know, sometimes people say, you know, I do all the moral things, but it has to be studied. Maybe they don't do some of the things, but they are doing many other things when they don't believe in religion, when they don't, you know, have any fear. Okay? Yes, if two people are doing the same, they do all the good things and avoid all the bad things and one of them does it voluntarily because he understands the goodness and bad and another them is worried and you know fearful the, this one, first one is better <coughs> but if there are two people one of them commits many sins because he doesn't find it bad he does you know all the adultery fornication drinking everything just he doesn't tell lies because says, I feel bad and then another person who doesn't do any of these bad things because of the fear of Jahannam? Okay, this is better because he's not doing any bad thing. Yeah, I'm saying you cannot look at only one action. Look at the entire character and the entire performance of a person. If a person is avoiding one percent of bad things just because finds bad that does 99 percent because she does he or she doesn't feel anything bad this person is a lower situation than the one who doesn't do any bad thing for the fear but if there is a person who does all the good things and avoids all the bad things because he or she understands the goodness and badness this is better like amir al-mu'minin alayhi salam he says I don't do anything because of fear of hell. 
or because I want to go to heaven. I do it because I find this is good. وَجَدْتُكَ أَحْلًا لِلْعِبَادَةِ So if you give me guarantee that I am not going to hell, still I don't commit sins. This is more valuable. But someone who is dying, doing many bad things and only avoids few bad things, shouldn't, you know, uh, feel that he's superior. He's more moral or more pious. Qalb is used in the Quran in different ways. Sometimes Qalb is used as a spirit, as human spirit, which has also the ability to understand. It's not only for emotions. For example, Allah says, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا So here Qalb doesn't mean only for emotions. It means also place for understanding. So it includes Aql. The first question, yes, Aql has to be trained. Aql has to be um, equipped with training. Because although Allah has given all of us Aql, and all of us, this is a very important point, we should know that our Aql functions in the same way. Maybe someone's aql is faster, sharper, but no aql misfunctions. It's not that in me aql says something, in you aql says something else. In all of us, aql says the same thing. Because hujja of Allah, how can hujja of Allah say different things? Is it possible that Prophet says to me something and to say to you something opposite? No. The same is with aql. In all people, even in Kuffar, Agl says the same thing. And this is why Kuffar say, Lo kunna nasma wa na aql ma kunna fiyasa. If you had followed our Agl, we were not here. But you need to learn how to think, how to argue. This is why we learn logic, because we want to train ourselves. Because sometimes, maybe by mistake, you make misuse of Agl. You think this argument is valid. So you have to train your act. You, the more you use, the more you study, the more you educate, the more you discuss, your aql becomes more and more balanced. So you don't need anything to be added to aql, but you just need to make sure that aql is growing. So religion teaches us things that we were not able to know ourselves confirms the things that we were able to know but we could have doubted or we could have disagreed and also gives us sanction and determination. The fact that Allah has promised us heaven and has warned us about hell, these are very important in our Mm, upbuilding, you know, uplifting and mm, improving. You know how much determination it gives us that we know that there is eternal blessing or eternal suffering. But we should reach the position that none of these would be affecting us. If you are said that, inshallah, you are guaranteed to go to heaven, you say, okay, so from tomorrow I don't pray. No. If you are guaranteed that you are going to heaven, from tomorrow you have to stay, pray more. Pardon? Okay. So, we need both aql and revelation. They supplement each other, they help each other, but none of them is sufficient in the sense that we don't use the other. None of them replaces the other. There is no conflict. There is real harmony. And this is one of the beauties of Islam, especially in the school of Ahlul Bayt. You can be 100% rational and at the same time religious. 
You know, there were people who were worried that if you do philosophy, if you do logic, you lose your iman. But we say no. You can do philosophy, you can do logic, and indeed you would be more mu'min. Prop, proper mu'min. Provided that you know how to do it. Not that you know, you go and study every a school of philosophy without being prepared, without having background, without having, you know, guidance. That's another issue. Okay, inshallah we'll continue after salat. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-aliyya al-azim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina abil qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad. Wa ala alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. La siyama baqiyyatillahi fil aradin. Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajahu al-sharif. اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين. We talked about the relation between reason and revelation, and we said there is harmony. They supplement each other, but none of them by itself is enough. We need both. If we want to know more about revelation or wah, uh, we can have a little discussion here. But if you are more interested, I have a paper uh, about revelation, which is published in the second volume of Islamic reference series, which is Word of God. In that volume, Word of God, there is a paper about revelation. And inshallah, you can read, you know, how many types of revelation are there, you know, uh, what is the meaning of revelation, and what is the nature of revelation. I mentioned a few points, but if you want more, you can shall I refer to that paper. Uh, it is called uh, Word of God, the volume is called Word of God, it's the second volume of Islamic reference series, and the paper is Revelation, called as revelations understood by Muslim men. In the Quran, so I make it very brief. In the Quran, the term wahi has been used in different ways. Awha, yuhi, awhayna. And it has been used in different ways. Sometimes wahi in the Quran is used for the guidance that Allah gives to different beings. For example, Awha ila kulli sama in Amra. He sent wah to a sky. Sometimes Allah says, Awha rabbuka ila nahl. An attakhidhi min al jibal buyuta. He sent wah to bees. Sometimes it's for angels. Sometimes it's for the prophets. So there are many different ways in which why has been used. If we want to classify all of them, we can say why is used in the Quran in one of the three ways. Sometimes as a kind of general guidance in the form of laws of nature or instincts. When Allah says he has revealed or he has sent wah to bees, it's not prophetic wah. means through their instincts, Allah has guided them how to make their hives. Or when he said he has revealed to the sky, it's the same. Sometimes wah means inspiration. For example, Allah says, Ohayna ila umm Musa an arda'i. What does it mean that Allah sent wahi to Mother of Musa? She was not a prophet. This means we inspired her inspiration. 
Inspiration in the Quran is also called wahy. Even sometimes can be bad inspiration. Like in the shayateen la yuhuna ba'aduhum ila ba'ad. Shayateen also inspire each other. They communicate to each other. But the main usage of wahy is prophetic revelation. This is what we want to know more. That Allah communicates to the prophets. This is revelation in the sense that we want to know more. For example, in chapter 42, verse 7, Allah says, Thus we have revealed to you an Arabic Quran, so that you may warn the mother of cities, Mecca, Umm al qura and all around, and warn them of the day of assembly, of which there is no doubt. So, this is one case. And there are many cases like this. For example, chapter 12, verse 3. We relate unto you the most beautiful story, Ahsan al-Qasas. In that we reveal to you the, this Quran. Before this, you two were among those who knew it not. This type of communication is called wahy because wahy means literally to pass on a message message quickly and secretly if i pass on a message to you without other people understanding it is called why in all these cases that the quran uses the term why is because of there is some kind of quick and secret message allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a very a special way communicates to the prophets other people don't know this communication is to them this communication to the prophets can be in different form, forms Allah says ma kana li basharin an yukallimahu Allah illa wahya <coughs> aw min wara'i hijab aw yursal rasula no one is spoken by God except in one of the three ways. Sometimes direct communication. Allah puts ideas, meanings, words, whatever, directly in the heart of the Prophet. Wahya. Aw min wara'i hijab. From behind a veil, like Prophet Musa. He heard from a bush, a tree, the message of God. O your seller rasul, and he sends a messenger. The prophet receives why from God through an angel. So sometimes an angel brings why. Sometimes from behind a whale. Sometimes directly Allah puts in the heart of the prophet. Okay, so one of the three ways. And if you want the reference, it's given in the paper. But let me also give you now. Surah Shura, uh, this is chapter 43, verse 51. All the three are mentioned in this. وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٌ يُكَلِّمَهُ اللَّهِ إِلَّا وَحْيَا أَوْ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابٍ أَوْ يُرْسَلَ رَسُولًا فَيُوحِي بِإِذْنِهِ مَا يَشَاءَ إِنَّهُ عَلِيٌّ حَكِيمٌ so you shouldn't think that always Jibra'il was bringing wah. No. Sometimes was no angel involved. Sometimes other angels were involved. Jibra'il was coming for very special occasions. And for our prophet Jibra'il was coming a lot. Something very important that I want to emphasize on is that wahy is a very special way of guidance, communication that leaves no doubt for the Prophet. No chance of illusion, confusion, forgetfulness, full of certainty. Unfortunately, you know, there is famous story that they say when the first time Prophet received wahy, he didn't know what has happened. He went to Lady Khadija 
Lady Khadija told you should go to visit my cousin Walaqat ibn Nawfal. They went to Walaqat ibn Nawfal and he listened to the Prophet said, you must have become a Prophet. This doesn't make sense. When a person he himself doesn't know that he is Prophet and he has sent, uh, received a message from God, how can he guide people? How can people trust such a person? We don't accept any story which suggests that the Prophet was not aware of what has happened. Because why is one of the most certain types of knowledge. It is so certain that the Quran uses the term vision for why. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ما ضاغ البصر وما طقى. When the Prophet saw, Allah says, his eyes didn't make mistake. His vision was correct. أَفَتُمَارُونَهُ عَلَى مَا يَرَى Are you debating with him about what he has seen? Of course, it's not physical eyes, but it is so clear. So it is so clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compares this to ru'ya. Because you know for us, normally the best type of knowledge is when we see something by our eyes. Yeah? So Allah says this is also like seeing by eyes. There is no doubt about this. Surah Najm verse 17. Of course, you can read it from before. It starts from here. فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى Allah revealed to his servant what he revealed. Verse 10. مَا كَذَبَ الْفُؤَادُ مَا رَأَى The heart didn't tell lies about what he seen. The heart seen. So. أَفَتُمَارُونَهُ عَلَى مَا يَرَى وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى إِنْدَ السِّدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى إِنْدَهَا جَنَّةُ الْمَعْوَى إِذْ يَكْشَى السِّدْرَةَ مَا يَكْشَى مَا ضَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا تَغَى لَقَدْ رَآ مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّ الْكُبْرَى Several times Allah says, so, he saw. This is because wah is very clear, very uh, immediate, no chance for anyone to get involved, you know, make mischief here, divert, nothing. Quran says, nazal. We sent it truthfully and it was delivered truthfully. لا يأتيه الباطل من بين يدي ولا من خلفه. Batil, falsehood cannot reach Quran, cannot reach revelation. No one can penetrate into this system. What is the point that Allah sends a message, then the message is lost? <coughs> if shayateen are so powerful that they can get into this system of communication, then it means, na'uzu billah, Allah is powerless. So when he wants to send a message, he makes sure that the message is received and also delivered. The Prophet also delivers the message properly. He cannot even add one letter to this. لو تقبل علينا بعض الأخاويل لأخذنا منه بالوتين ثم لقطع لأخذنا منه باليمين ثم لقطعنا منه الوتين. Okay. All the problem starts when after we receive the message. Allah sends the message truthfully. Message comes down truthfully. The Prophet delivers truthfully. When we receive the message, then all the problems start. In interpreting the message, in acting according to the message, or na'uzu billah, changing the message in the previous revelations, this is the problem, yes. Which dream? Not wah in the sense of Sharia. 
But the dreams of the prophets are hujja. Yeah. No, no. Even one time was enough, but he had it several times to be more convinced. And this is why he says, Ya Bunaya inni ara fil manam anni azbahuk. He said, I saw in dream that I am slaughtering you. He didn't say I have to slaughter you. He said, I saw in dream that I am slaughtering you. Ismail got the message. Realized that this is a command. So he said, Ya Abatif al Matu Umar. Do what you are commanded. He was very clever. He realized that when he's seeing a dream, this dream is not just a dream. It's a message from God. So do what you are commanded. So, why leaves no place, no space for ambiguity when the prophet is concerned? There are some beautiful hadiths I want to share with you. One hadith is from Imam Askari alayhi salam. Imam says, this is my translation. Verily God found the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the best and with the greatest capacity. So he chose him for prophethood. His heart was the biggest, the largest, had the greatest capacity. Because to send wahi is very difficult. It's a very heavy word. It's very difficult. You know, imagine if a, a scholar, a philosopher speaks for one hour. You all get headache after one hour. Yeah? Now imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving your, his knowledge to you. Allah says to the Prophet that we have given knowledge to you وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهَ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا and it has been great favor. So for the Prophet to cope with this is very difficult. Even Prophet with the big heart was struggling. You know, some people thought Prophet is dying when he was receiving wahi. He was sweating, you know, it was like, you know, connecting power to someone. High voltage, you know, power. It's very difficult. But he had the heart to maintain. So he has Shah Hassab. But the Quran is too big. So even with someone of, uh, like Rasulullah, receiving Quran is not easy. Because it's very heavy. It's very heavy. Allah says, that لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشدة. If it was revealed to a mount, it was humbled and made into pieces. So Rasulullah had great capacity that he could remain alive. So Imam Askari says, Allah found his heart the best and with the greatest capacity. Another hadith is Imam Sadiq alayhi salam answering a question of Zurara. Zurara, you know, was a very good companion of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam and he made very good question. He said, O oh, Imam, how did Rasulullah realize that what he received was a genuine revelation? It was not temptation from shaitan. It's a good question. Imam said, when God chooses a servant of him to become an apostle, he bestows upon that person confidence and tranquility. So what comes to him from God is like what he sees with his eyes. <coughs> this is in Tafsir Ayyashi, volume 2, page 201, and also Biharul Anwar, 
volume 18, page 262. So, leaves no doubt. He becomes very confident, very sure about this. Pardon? Sure. There is another hadith. A person asked Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, how the apostles knew that they were apostles? Imam replied, the whale, qita, was removed from them. When they become prophet, they can see the hidden world. There is no qita. Muhammad ibn Muslim, another companion, says that he had a conversation with Imam Sadiq about who is muhaddath. Now we have muhaddath, means narrator of hadith, or scholar of muhaddath, means the one who is spoken with. Who are the people who are muhaddath? Imam salam said, muhaddath is the one who hears the voice and doesn't see. Prophet is the one who also sees in addition to hearing the voice. Muhammad ibn Muslim then asked, in that case, how does he know that this was the speech of the angel? Imam said he will be bestowed with confidence and tranquility so that he knows that it was the angel that spoke to him. So no doubt remains there. It's 100% clear that this is a good communication. This is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's light. It's not dark. They understand that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes revelations had only meanings and ideas. Sometimes revelation had both meanings and wording. In the case of Quran, it's very clear that what was revealed to the Prophet was both meaning and words. Because unfortunately there are some people who say, Allah revealed to the Prophet and then the Prophet himself chose the words. He put them into these, you know, sentences. He used the concepts which were familiar to the people of that age to explain the revelation and then the result is that those words are not divine sometime maybe today we understand better there is no infallibility here this is a very false idea the Quran is very clear that the revelation involved wording when you say kitab can kitab be just meaning without words? When you say iqra, can it be just meaning, concept without wording? How can you read something which has no wording? Or talawa, yatlu alayhim ayat. How can you recite something which has no wording? Or says lisan and arabi. How can someone have Arabic language without wording? So it's very clear that the revelation in the case of Quran involved wording. It had both meanings and wording. Every word in the Quran is revealed by Allah himself. Rasulullah didn't himself choose the words. The words, the order of the word, everything is decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even one letter is not that decided by Rasulullah. It's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you know Arabic and you are familiar with the hadith of Rasulullah, you find that the hadith of Rasulullah are very much different from Quran. The style is different. A style of hadith of Rasulullah, his own words, are different from Quran. And Rasulullah's hadith are very much also different from Amirul Mumini's words. They are very different. Rasulullah's hadith are very clear, very easy, very straightforward. Amirul Mu'minis are very, you know, stylish and very kind of, uh, yes. 
Both are eloquent, but very different. Rasulullah said this, everyone can understand. If you know, a little Arabic, you understand. Amirul Mu'minin said this, are very difficult. Most of them, you have to be expert to understand. And again, Rasulullah's hadith compared to the Quran are very much different. He didn't himself choose the word, the order. Even we believe that which verse belongs to which surah is according to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because, you know, some of the surahs were not revealed at the same time. For example, Surah Baqarah was not revealed at the same time. In different occasions. But Rasulullah was telling the Qutabul Wahy, the scribes of the Wahy, that this surah has these verses, this must be put here, this must be put here. Everything according to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why, you know, these surahs have some special, you know, uh, influence sometimes, special effects. Uh, if you want, uh, you refer to uh, lectures I had uh, in the month of Ramadan two years, two, uh, two years ago. It's on YouTube uh, about introduction to the Quran. There are 14 lectures about the Quran. And in some of the lectures, we discuss this issue about the linguistic aspect of the Quran, about the fact that the order was not decided by Muslims or, you know, uh, Khulafa compiling the Quran. Everything is according to the guidance of Allah through the Prophet. One of the things that we have to remember about the Prophets is that all the Prophets were ma'asum, they were infallible. Our Sunni brothers, they believe in infallibility of the Prophets, but to some extent. They say in delivering the message they were infallible. But in their personal life, some of our Sunni brothers say in personal life they could have done unintentional sins. Some of them they say they could have done minor sins. And before becoming prophet, they were not ma'asum. We say prophets were infallible in personal life, prophetic life, and before becoming prophets. We have many hadiths about this, but I bring one intellectual argument. First of all, you should know that committing sins darkens the heart. If someone is not pure and pious, how can he receive wahy? How can he be addressed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Receiving wahy is not like receiving a letter. Any person can receive letter. The most pious person can send a letter to the most wicked person. Yeah? Receiving wah needs to be pious, to be pure, to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone is sinful or idol worshipper, has been drinking alcohol, doing, you know, facade, and then he becomes a good person and then he receives wah. This is not possible. Even someone who has been all his life pious struggles to receive wah. If someone has these impacts of sins and shirk. So, first of all, we should know that wah is not something normal. But the main argument that I think we can use is this. If someone in his personal life commits sins or even mistakes, People don't trust him. You know, imagine when I am in the mosque on member, I am good. But you know that in my house, I am committing sins. 
So all in his personal life is not important. In member he is a nice person. Or for example, I tell you I have knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I lose my you know, direction. When I go home I get lost. Say so no problem, this is personal life, he made a mistake. How can people trust someone who makes such mistakes when he's informing us about the news of skies and heaven? The people who are supposed to trust Prophet 100%, because even people, when they know that this man is telling the truth, still they bring lots of excuses to escape, to run away. Yeah? Now imagine if they see some problems, this, this person. And they will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we were not sure because this person sometimes is committing sins, sometimes is forgetting things. So maybe he forgot. Or if a person up to yesterday, he was not infallible, he was making mistakes, he was committing sins, then how can people trust him and say, now he has become infallible? Rasulullah was such a person that even 40 years before becoming prophet, no one heard any lies from him. And still they didn't believe in him. They called him Amin, honest. For 13 years in Mecca, still they knew he is Amin. Still they left their treasures and valuable things with him. When Rasulullah was migrating to Medina, still he had their trust. Still they didn't believe in him. Now imagine if he had told one lie in his life. So maybe it's a second lie. Or if Na'uzubillah, he was after, you know, some mischief. Say, oh, he is after power. He is deceiving us. So someone who had clear history, still, they didn't follow him. They were bringing excuses. Rasulullah, all his life never worshipped idol. And still these people were attached to the idols. Now imagine if Rasulullah himself was, you know, an idol worshipper for some years. They say, oh, you yourself were like us. Now you are telling us not to do this? So, anything that would not let people trust a prophet 100% should be avoided. You may ask, how is it possible that a person doesn't do sins even unintentionally? This is the main question. We understand that prophet must not commit sin intentionally. Even our great ulama, they don't do sins intentionally. We are sure that many of our ulama never have done any sin un, you know, intentionally. But sometimes we human beings may do something unintentionally. What about the prophets? The answer is this. First of all, their level of knowledge and understanding is so high that they never do things which are bad, even unintentionally. Like what? Have you ever unintentionally went to the street without dress? When you went to the street, you realize, oh, I am naked. Even unintentionally, you don't do this. Have you ever unintentionally, when you went to these shops, taken a bottle of wine? Unintentionally. No. Why? Because this is for us very clear that this is a bad thing, this is an ugly thing, this is what I don't like. When something for us is not very clear to be bad and still we have a little interest, so sometimes when we unintentionally we do it. But if 100% is clear that it is bad, it tastes bad, it smells bad, you don't like it, you never do it. I am sure if you know, they put you know, wine all over the you know, place, no one goes after, uh, close to the wine. Because we hate. The smell you know, is something even that we don't like. Alhamdulillah. So, every scene for the prophets is like this. 
it tastes bad, it looks bad, it's terrible. What about mistakes? Or what about, for example, when they were a little child? We say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he knows a person is going to have a very important role, he is going to be a guide for humanity. He is a pious person, but he may make mistakes. Allah says, okay, now because you are a pious person and you are going to guide my people, I protect you even against the mistakes. Ma'asum means protected, means saved. So, it is a gift from Allah, but not a gift that if I had it also could be the same. No, he doesn't do any sin. But with respect to the mistakes, Allah saves him. With respect to the unintentional things, Allah saves him. Because of himself and because of Allah wants him to be our guide. You know how much Allah has blessed us that he has provided us with Prophet and Imams. You shouldn't think that Allah, whatever Allah has given to the Prophet, it was for himself. Allah has given to the Prophet a lot because me and you also. Whatever Prophet receives is for all of us. So, this is what we understand from some of the texts also. For example, in Du'ai Nudbah. In the beginning of Du'ai Nudbah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's prophets are mentioned, we say, شَرَطْتَ عَلَيْهِمُ الزُّحْتِ فِي دَرَجَاتِ هَذِهِ الدُّنْيَا الدَّنِيَةِ A very important requirement a very important obligation for the Prophet was not to be interested in dunya. You made a condition. You have to be zahid. Okay? Not to be interested in dunya. Sharatta alayhimu zuhd fi darajat haadhi dunya wa zukhrufiha wa zabrajaha. Fasharatu laka zalik. They accepted this condition. وَعَلِمْتَ مِنْهُمُ الْوَفَاءَ بِهِ And you knew that they are loyal. When you knew that in future they are going to be loyal, فَقَبِلْتَهُمْ You accepted them in advance. وَقَرَّبْتَهُمْ And you brought them closer to you. وَقَدَّمْتَ لَهُمُ الذِّكْرَ الْعَلِيِّ وَالثَّنَاءَ الْجَلِيِّ And in advance you sent for them beautiful name. Before they were born, you told everyone that I am going to have this prophet in Akhir zaman who is such a nice person. He has not yet been born, but you knew how he is going to do in future, so you supported him from before. Like what? Like you are a teacher, very experienced teacher, by being with the students for a few sessions, you understand who is a good student, who is a bad student. Among your students, you find someone is very talented, very genius, very also hardworking, very nice. So you know that this student is going to be very special. So do you wait till end of the year, till exams are, you know, corrected and marks are given or you say from now on I should spend more time with him I should help him if he needs some books I give him he needs extra time I will spend with him because this person has a bright future Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew in advance the prophets are going to be loyal so he accepted them brought them nearer to himself protected them against mistakes so they could function as prophet and as guide and role models for us or we have about lady fatima salamullah alayha ya mumtahana imtahanak allah alladhi khalaqak qabla an yakhluqak 
Allah who has created you, tested you before creating you. فَوَجَدَكَ لِمَمْ تَحَنَكَ الصَّابِرَةِ Before creating you, he tested you and found that you are patient. So when Allah knows it, because he knows past, present, future, when he knows that someone is going to be good, so even before that person is born, Allah supports that person. No one can protest, say, why you didn't support me? Because I knew that you are not going to be like him. You have been given enough. But this person is going to be a role model. I give him more. Because I want all people to benefit from this. I am helping him in against mistakes. So, Esma is a gift, but this gift is not given without reason. Any gift that Allah gives has reason. When Allah gives knowledge, hikmah, anything to someone has reason. You have to qualify yourself. So Esma is one of the qualities. Another important quality is knowledge. Prophets have a special knowledge. What we call Elm al Means knowledge which is given by Allah. This expression Elm al is because of this ayah, chapter 18, verse 65. فَوَجَدَ عَبْدًا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا آتَيْنَاهُ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا We taught him from ourselves. عَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا Some people have knowledge through learning school books. And this is good. Knowledge is very good. Chapter 18, verse 65. But sometimes knowledge comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophets had this type of knowledge. Indeed, our prophet never went to a school. Yeah? He didn't have any teacher. He didn't read or write. Why? Quran explains. مَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلَهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكَ إِذَنْ لَرْتَابَ الْمُبْطِلُونَ you never read anything, you never wrote anything, because if you had done so, then people who were after excuses, they would say, oh, this person has learned this. The Prophet was able to read, but he never read anything. He never wrote anything. Okay? Because to leave no chance for anyone to say, he had a teacher who told him these stories. Of course, this was not a valid, you know, excuse. But Mubtelun, those who are after false reasons, you know, they could have said this. Otherwise, even if Rasulullah had gone to a school, there was no a school who could produce Quran. Even today, with so many universities and schools, who is able to produce like Quran? If they can produce, it's very good to produce so that they can defeat Islam. Yes. Yeah, the Prophet uh, wiped it. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't write. No, no. There was a matter of wiping. Wiping what was written because they said, we don't accept you are Rasulullah. So the Prophet himself put his finger, but uh, some narration said, he asked to put my finger on Rasulullah, which one things, and he removed. So, prophets have a special knowledge, Elm al Allah teaches them directly. Then there is a discussion in the book about Elm al Do the prophets know Elm al or not? Do they have knowledge about the unseen or hidden things? There are different verses in the Quran. Some verses of the Quran says that only Allah knows Elm al for example, chapter 6, verse 59. وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِيهُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُ No one knows غيب other than Allah. This is one group of verses. 
Only Allah knows. But there are some other verses who suggest that other people can be also given access to al ghayb For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Jinn, verses 26 and 27, He says, Alim al fala min rasul. No one knows ghayb except Rasul. So when some verses says that no one knows ilmul ghayb means independently. No one has access to ilmul ghayb independently except Allah. But Allah discloses ilmul ghayb to the people that he is pleased with. The same is with shafa'ah. Some verses of the Quran says that only Allah does shafa'ah. No one has shafa'ah. But some verses says there are people that Allah is pleased with their shafa'ah. So you have to bring all these verses together. Sometimes, you know, some people say uh, no one knows al Mulghayb and they only focus on those verses which is talking about knowing al Mulghayb independently. Because when you bring all the verses together, the result is that no one knows other than Allah, but He teaches al Mulghayb to some people, like prophets. Another quality of the prophets, this is the last point for tonight, is willpower. The prophets had very strong willpower. Because, you know, most of our problems is what? Is that we know, but we don't practice. You know, it's not that we don't know. Many of the things that we know, we don't practice because we are lazy or we are weak. We are not determined. Yeah? We know that, for example, it is good for us to have exercise every day. But we are not determined. For every little thing, we stop. We know that it is good to have Salatul Layl, but then we sleep. We know that a smoking cigarette is bad, but we are not that strong to avoid. Okay? Of course, people have different problems. Maybe you avoid this problem, but... So. Determination is very important. Among all the prophets... The most outstanding ones are called Ulul Azm. Fasbir kama sabara Ulul Azm min al-Rasul. Surah Ahqaf, verse 35. Why they are called Ulul Azm? Allah could have said Ulul Ilm, Ulul Hilm, Ulul Sabr, Ulul Hikmah. But he highlights Azm. Determination. Not to give up. To be persistent. And it is interesting that when Allah refers to Prophet Adam, what does he say? Lam najid lahu azma. We didn't find determination in Adam. So in a sense he's teasing Adam. When he says these are ulul azm, it means these are not like Adam. Lam najid lahu azma. Adam didn't have this determination. Okay? But these have determination. When they offered the Prophet Muhammad sallam, that we give you money, position, best, you know, most beautiful women. But don't say anything about, you know, uh, these idols. He said, if you give earth to one hand and moon in another hand, I don't stop. They tortured, they killed, they never stopped. This is determination. Imam Ali alayhi salam said to his son, Tazulul al jabal wala tazul. If all the mountains move, you should not move. You have to be so strong. Al mu'minu kal jabal al rasikh la tuharrakuhu al abasif. Mu'min is like a very high mount. Nothing can move mu'min. So this determination is very important. If Allah gives us this, it's very important. 
there is a saying of Imam Zainul Abidin, Inna ilayk. The best provision, the best zad of the wayfarer towards Allah is what? Azmu iradatan yakhtaruka biha. Is to have determination. By which he chooses Allah over everything else. If Allah gives us this azm and determination, we can cope with all the problems and remain successful. Unfortunately, we always give up. If we were persistent, even angels would come to us. This is Quran. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَا اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَ those who say Allah is our Lord and they remain persistent. Angels come to them. Like angels coming in the night of God to Imam Zaman. Angels come to these people. تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُ وَأَبْشَرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّذِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَنُ They said don't have any worry, no fear, no grief. And there is Bishara of heaven for you. If you remain persistent. So this is another quality of the prophets. Infallibility, knowledge, determination. These are important qualities of the prophets. Inshallah we continue this tomorrow.